Greetings and welcome to the sixth annual Indovasco Conference for Africa and Rural America. I'm Herbert Oye, and I'm talking to you from Beckley, West Virginia. We're, we're very thankful you're able to join us today from all parts of the world. We would like to uh, indicate that um, we have a few things. This is a CME um, accredited um, talk or a series of talks. So your, your participation uh, cooperation will be essential uh, for you to obtain your CMEs. Dr. Uh, Gupta, the coordinator of the program, will um, come to you at some point during, during the conference and give you, give you in, in information on how to do that. Uh, again, the Endovasa Conference for Africa, sixth annual, time has flown so fast. The first one was held in 2018 in Bialsa, West, uh, Bialsa Nigeria in 2019. And uh, 2020, where the world was uh, faced with a COVID pandemic, and uh, we were able to do a virtual platform then uh, in Beckley, West Virginia. In 2021 and 2022, we were able to now do a conference virtual and in person in Lagos. Last year's conference was hosted by Duchess Hospital in Lagos, and uh, they did a fantastic job. The CEO there was um, as uh, Mr. Tooks uh, 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 Shidabe, we're grateful to, to him and his team for help, helping us out with the program last year. This year's program uh, has been um, hosted by Rowley General Hospital here in Beckley, West Virginia. And we'd like to uh, say thank you to the CEO, uh, Mr. David Bunch and his, um, and his administrative staff for the support provided. Our conference again, as CME accredited and we would um, list your participation and cooperation to make it successful. The conference um, is an innovative and forward thinking gathering dedicated to the dissemination of um, endovascular knowledge, clinical judgment and uh, decision making. The, these we feel are very essential for successful endovascular and vascular um, therapies. Our goal is to bridge the divide or gap that exists between developed countries and developing countries with respect to endovascular care. Endovascular care, I will speak more in my keynote speech, uh, um, in Africa is really uh, lagging behind compared to the other countries. Our mission is to make endovascular surgery care affordable and available uh, in disadvantaged communities in Africa and America and around the world. We look forward to a robust conference that is educational, informative, and, uh, and innovative. Uh, there will be thought-provoking talks and discussions on healthcare. Um, latest cutting-edge technologies will be presented uh, by international by uh, interventional cardiologists, uh, endovascular specialists, nephrologists, and um, cancer specialists. We look forward to your participation in this year's conference. And um, and uh, for all the all of you uh, tuning in from um, Africa, we thank you so much because we know the time difference is significant. And um, uh, participants also from Australia were also thankful to you and the U UK. Uh, the uh, the I would be remiss if I don't say thank you to uh, affiliate uh, uh, institutions and um, foundations, the Uzuma. Um, foundation, which is um, quite uh, helpful in uh, trying to improve healthcare um, outcomes in Africa, and uh, the uh, 
International Society of Endovascular Specialists, which um, has Africa chapter that, uh, that I currently um, help run in Nigeria, the Edward B. Dietrich Vascular Society, which uh, is a testament to our mentor and trainer, Dr. D. B. Dietrich, Edward B. Dietrich, and uh, other uh, contributors are the Bialsa Specialist Hospital Silver, uh, in Bialsa, um, Silver Cross Hospital in Abuja, Salem Hospital in Mori, Silver Life Mission Hospital in um, Port Harcourt, and the Federal Medical Center, Kathy. Um, Mrs. Sharon Williams has been an ardent and trusted yearly sponsor of our program. We, uh, we uh, say thank you to her. We also uh, hope that all other uh, potential uh, sponsors of Goodwill will participate in this venture. The, uh, at, this, at this juncture, I will call on Dr. Gupta to give you some housekeeping rules uh, towards uh, the conference. Dr. Gupta. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Gupta, recent graduate. Um, thank you all for coming. You all probably got emails from me based on the conference. Um, so this year, because it is CME accredited, I will share the disclosure. There is nothing to disclose um, from the participants nor the uh, coordinators. Um, so throughout the conference, we will be asking questions uh, due to the CME accreditation. So if you could put your responses in the chat, that way we can document it. Um, also, if everybody could put their emails in the chat whenever you get a chance as you come in, so I can also document that and send the um, attendance list to the respected people at the end of the conference. Um, so this activity has been planned um, and implant implanted in accordance with the accreditation requirements and policies of the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education through the joint providership of the Raleigh County Medical Society and, their, and the Edward B. Dietrich Vascular Surgical Society. The Raleigh County Medical Society is accredited by the ACCME to provide continuing medical education for physicians. The Kentucky Medical Association designates this live activity for a total of 8.75 AMA PRA Category 1 credits. That's for the full two days is a total of 8.75 credits. Um, physicians should only claim the credit uh, with the extent of their participation. So I will write down how long each uh, physician's participating and um, you will get the cert certificate following the conference next week. Um, so there'll be questions about what you learned during the presentations, how you can apply it into your practice, case-based questions, true or false, things like that. Um, so your participation is needed uh, so we can make sure you get your credits. We are really excited to have you all participate. And um, if you have any questions even during participate uh, during presentations, just drop them in the chat and the uh, presenter will answer them accordingly. Thank you. And I'll give it back to Dr. Oye. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Our mission statement for this conference is to enhance endovascular surgery access in rural America and Africa, <clears throat> provide healthcare <clears throat> education, <clears throat> and reduce mortality due to strokes, heart attacks, vascular disease, kidney failure, and cancer. We are quite aware that in Africa, the disease profile now is mimicking what we see in the Western world uh, due to dietary habits and uh, lifestyle changes. And uh, we, are, uh, we have a, a serious uh, problem in our hands we have to not only look at preventative measures, as well as in, the, in, the, in addition to curative measures, which we provide. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Our program objectives, again, are to create awareness of, of lack of access in rural communities, uh, facilitate discussions to inspire out-of-the-box thinking for clinical applications of relevant endovascular interventions, address patient outcomes and challenges of endovascular care in Africa and rural America, and also to advance performance for endovascular techniques in rural communities globally. I'd like to, uh, at this juncture, call on our next speaker, uh, Cynthia Isang, who will be giving us a 
some uh, info about uh, the progress of endovascular care in Bielsa, West Virginia, and in Lagos. Cynthia. Hi, everyone. Greetings from Nigeria. Um, it's been my pleasure to be in your midst as we um, officially commence the sixth annual endovascular conference for Africa and rural America. Firstly, I'd like to join Dr. Oye to welcome everyone who's here. Thank you for joining us again. And I'm particularly excited that we're here because um, looking back to when we started six years ago, the maiden edition of the endovascular conference was held um, in Bayelsa, where I happen to be the um, community chief executive officer of the Bayelsa Specialist Hospital. Right, so um, it's it's interesting to see how we have made some progress in our quest for the advancement of endovascular care in Africa. Now, Nigeria, as we know, is um, you know hugely populated. We've got a huge population of over 160 to 170 million people, and we have a huge gap in the healthcare sector, there's a lacuna, right? And um, beyond um, healthcare infrastructure, beyond having access to you know, contemporary healthcare infrastructure, one of the things that we're faced with is um, the proper treatment, prompt and proper treatment to you know, life-threatening um, ailments. Speaking specifically about um, amputations, looking at the theme for this year's conference, reducing unnecessary amputations, right? When we look at the situation in Nigeria, the statistics of um, amputations uh, is rather high. And it says that at about 23.5% of the total number of amputations that we have in Nigeria is as a result of um, complications from diabetes or um, gangrenous um, food injuries, right? So it is very timely, this discussion that we're gonna be having for these two days. Now that said, we've made some kind of progress, although we're still very far from where we hope to be. Um, so far, we've been able to, in the last um, couple of years, pitch tent in Bielsa to, um, you know, bridge that gap we have in endovascular care, right? Thankfully, with the presence and the help of Dr. Oye, and a team of specialists across the pond, we've been able to have um, a system where patients who have these um, leg injuries, we were able to salvage their limbs. So we reduce the number of limb losses by having um, a connect you know, with the team at, uh, in the United States. So what happens is we find patients here who have these um, cases who are probably set up for amputation and with the quick intervention of Dr. Oye and his team, we're able to, or we've been able to so far save a couple of lives and save a couple of limbs. So we're hoping that with the insight that we'll get from this conference, we will add that to what we're already doing to see that we help save more lives, right? And I'll implore every one who's in Africa, specifically Nigeria at this point, has participated in this conference to please take a um, great opportunity, uh, take, take advantage of this great opportunity because all that you'll learn in these two days will help you know in your discharge of your um, duties as healthcare practitioner. So I will not take all of our time because we're here to learn, right? I'm super excited about that. So I'm going to step back and let us take you from here. But once again, I'm happy to be in your midst and I hope that we'll have an amazing time so far. Now, if you're in Nigeria, you're in Bielsa, Lagos, anywhere in Nigeria and you, you know, you have questions, you have questions about certification and everything, please just leave a chat in the chat box and um, I'll respond, respond to you. But ultimately, yes, again, thank you and let's have a blast.
Thank you, Cynthia. We'll adjust the schedule as we go, just to ensure that uh, we continue to move on and stay on time the best we can. Uh, our next speaker uh, would be uh, one of my uh, promising young uh, medical students uh, who uh, uh, will be talking to us today on the fundamentals of uh, wound care. I uh, would uh, bring up Dr. Crystal Lambracos to uh, talk about uh, this very important uh, subject. I know that when I travel to Nigeria and other parts of Africa, wound-related wound issues are a major problem that um, people are faced with. People have uh, wounds that are there for many years. And uh, the challenge is uh, identifying if the venous wounds, arterial wounds, uh, and the like, and appropriate treatment, uh, therefore, to uh, make this um, to make them better. So it's important that we have a good handle or grip on wound care solutions. And uh, uh, Crystal will be uh, talking to us and giving us some uh, some insights on this matter. You ready, Dr. Crystal? All right. All right. So here's uh, uh, student Dr. Crystal Lambracus. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good evening, depending where you are. I'm just gonna pull up my presentation here. Great. Okay, welcome to the sixth annual Global Endovascular Conference for Rural America and Africa. I'm gonna be presenting the fundamentals of wound care. Let's go next slide. What are the goals of this presentation? I want you to be able to identify the difference between acute and chronic wounds. How do we approach wound care? And understanding some chronic diseases, disease states that can affect wound healing. What is a wound? A wound is a disruption of the normal function of the skin and soft tissue architecture. There are two main types, acute and chronic. Acute wounds will naturally progress through expect, expected stages of healing, and they close with primarily simple techniques, sutures, staples, and they go on to, to heal no, normally. Chronic wounds have physiologically impaired um, healing. To ensure proper healing, the wounds need to be well vascularized, there's be good blood supply, free of devitalized tissue, which means you gotta remove the necrotic tissue, clear of an infection, and moist. Wound dressings help eliminate dead space. Dead space is where bacteria can flourish. They control exudate, they prevent bacterial overgrowth, and ensure proper fluid balances. And it's important to make sure that they are cost effective. Okay, this presentation is going to highlight the ideology the diagnosis and some of the management of different wounds. What are the five main steps you should follow when managing a wound? So a patient comes to you and they have a wound, right? What are the first things we do, okay? We do assessment, cleaning and investigations, regular dressings, documentation, right? Select the appropriate dressing and as well as add antibiotics when required. Assessment and vitals, okay? It's important to, to, to understand what's going on here, okay? Is the patient acutely bleeding, okay? That needs to be controlled, managed. You need to preserve hemodynamic stability for critically injured patients, okay? You will place two wide bore IVs and initiate resuscitation following the guidelines of your hospital. The acronym A, B, C, D, E, um, airways, breathing, circulation, um, um, yes, just, yes, and then uh, distractibility, and uh, and then uh, the E is for environmental, like what is going on hypothermia. I I personally don't like that acronym. It doesn't serve high acute wounds. I like to follow the MARCH acronym, okay? The MARCH acronym is major hemorrhage. Address the major hemorrhage first, 
Okay, then we can go on to airway, respiration, circulation, and then hypothermia, head injury, whatever's going on. Okay. Now, if a patient comes in and they have a chronic wound, this is a wound that they've had for several years, our investigations are going to kind of go somewhere else. Do they have fever? Do they have high heart rate? What's going on with their respiration? This is where we look for signs of sepsis. Okay, this is the search criteria. Search criteria here I included that can help us identify if there's an infection and we need to aggressively treat. Second, cleaning the wound, okay? We gotta keep it simple. Some of the investigations you can order is, you know, you can do a wound culture, gram staining, and do some sensitivity um, to see what's the best antibiotic we can use. A CBC, CRP, procalcitonin to track infection, blood cultures, and x-rays, CT and MRI, if we have access to them, can help us identify the extent of damage. Irrigation with fluids are important. It helps decrease the bacterial load and it removes a lot of the loose material that should be part of, and it should always be part of wound care management. I recommend like warm saline is what we use. You don't need to use anything strong, iodine washes, hydrogen peroxides. It has not been shown to help healing and it can be sometimes detrimental to the tissue. Regular dressing changes. Okay, so this is where we need to change dressings often, uh, maybe one to every two days, depending on the wound, right? These dressings will absorb the exudate and it will protect the wounds. They prevent bacteria and invasion and proliferation. They help conform to the wound shape. They eliminate the dead space that I was referring to before where bacteria can grow. They we debride the necro necrotic tissue to, and to enable granulation tissue to kind of grow and, and help the healing. And make sure that those dressings do not affect the surrounding tissue. They don't put pressure on the surrounding tissue and macerate it. Okay. It helps the compression of the dressings can also help with controlling the bleeding and healing. And make sure that the dressings are intact. They don't have shredded fibers. Nothing is going to, you know, contaminate or leave foreign bodies in the wound. Here I put a picture of a wound. We should also always try to document the size. Um, in clinic, sometimes I'll even sketch the wound. Uh, if you don't have access to a camera or you can't take a picture of it, I will draw it out because it's important to see, is the wound healing? Is the wound growing? And there's no way to understand unless we have adequate documentation. Here I discuss appropriate dressings. It, open dressings, they're um, primarily gauze, which is moistened and then with saline and you place it on the wound. They have, they have the ability to absorb more. And some of the reasons why we could use it is to cover and protect the superficial wound, absorb the dressing, uh, absorb some of the wound drainage, uh, apply topical medications, uh, add some pressure when you have pressure ulcers and it'll manage the light, uh, the light drainage. Uh, and we can also use them to help pack wounds. Now there's semi-open dressings. Those are more of like a mesh or a gauze, some wax. Those are more for like pressure ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers, uh, skin tears, those abrasions. And semi-occlusive dressings. These are the dressings that kind of more like foams, um, aginates, films, those are for venous leg ulcers, diabetic ulcers, and, and those heavy exudative wounds. They provide like a lot of stability. And lastly, antibiotics. Not all wounds need antibiotics. Do not overuse antibiotics, will breed resistance. Antibiotics should only be used if the wound is infected and has a high uh, suspicion for infection. So use all your senses, your sight, your smell, your touch. Does the wound feel warm? Um, just don't taste. Okay. So some topical antibiotics you can start off with is um, they have these multi-purpose uh, neomycin, polymycin B, and baxotracin. Uh, there's the sulfur um, sulfur sulfadiazide. That's more for burns. 
and Bactrazin. Oral, anti oral antibiotics only when required uh, for more severe wounds. You can give like amoxicillin, you can give the cephalzolin, cephalaxin, and for patients with cellulitis, you can go even with doxy um, doxycycline. Now I will discuss some of the chronic disease states that affect wound healing. We'll start with uh, arterial disease. Okay. Arterial disease. This is peripheral artery disease caused by atherosclerotic disease, and it's accelerated by diabetes, smoking, and uncontrolled hypertension. Approximately 10 to 25% of males above the age of 60 have peripheral artery disease of some extent. Okay, the six Ps of peripheral artery disease, pallor, pain, paresthesia, paralysis, pulselessness, and pilokilothermia, which means coldness. Okay, the first step is to be able to identify um, a pulse. You can use a Doppler uh, to identify, and if, if no pulse is found, then we can go for CTA with runoff. Uh, these wounds are usually identified in areas of pressure under the heels, the back, coccyx. Um, they're usually circular. I, here you can see they have a dark base and they have limited to no, no uh, edema. Okay, so here, if you look at this image, we have a patient that Dr. Oye and I worked on, which had a complete left common iliac occlusion. And we had to kind of go and manage that with a uh, graft, a femoral femoral bypass. So we try to preserve as much as we can endovascularly. We try to balloon and stent, as you can see here. Uh, and if not, then we, we go for bypass. Venous disease. Okay. Venous disease are caused by venous insufficiency, DVTs, and varicose veins. We can detect them with venous Doppler and venous ultrasound, and we use to identify DVTs and blockages. Here's a quick video that you know we've taken in the clinic. Let's see if it'll play out. Maybe not. Okay. So the management of these diseases can be done through medical management using uh, blood thinners and TPA. IVC filters uh, can be used as well. And there's a device here that Dr. Oye has used where you kind of go in and you, you remove the clot uh, with TPA and angioplasty and you, and you perform some stenting. Diabetic foot wounds. Patients with type 1 and type 2 that have uncontrolled diabetes they're at a higher propensity to develop wounds. And this is due to like neuropathy, immunocompromise, and accelerated atherosclerotic disease. Here's some quick diagnostic parameters. You know, the fasting blood sugar from 100 to 125 is considered prediabetes. And 126 to 7 is, is confirmation of diabetes. Management of this can be done through medically, achieving adequate control of glycemic index. But that doesn't always mean it will improve the wound healing that hasn't been shown in the literature. So that's a start. We control the glycemic index. And then from there, we, we continue to make sure that there's adequate blood flow. Lymphedema and cancer. Uh, I put these together. They, they do appear separately. Um, so patients with a history of cancer uh, and surgical excision of inguinal uh, lymph nodes, and as well as radiation, they can have a disruption in the ability for lymphatics to drain. So you end up with large um, lymphedema. So lymphedema is an often, often isn't detected quickly uh, the, in, in its early, most uh, manageable uh, stage. The first sign of lymphedema is pitting, the presence of pitting. It's important to, when you're addressing pitting, that you hold down pressure more than one second. Give it five seconds, give it 10 seconds. Identify if there's true pitting. And from there, we can use, oh, there's a lot of different managements we can use. Lymphedema pumps, which is here indicated. This is something we use in the clinic often, and it helps put pressure on the lymphatics and sort of remove the fluid. It's also a treatment for a cellulitis presentation. 
last here we have necrotizing fasciitis. This is this isn't a medical emergency. The patient needs to be sent to the OR immediately. This can be caused by group A streptococcus, uh, which is that by origins, and Vibrio vulnificus if the patient has exposure to um, something water, somewhere around the water, something like that. Those the bacteria will usually enter through breaks in the skin. The infection travels quickly along the fascia, which is why we need to act quickly. Patients with diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and cancer have an increased risk. Some of the symptoms include warm, red, swollen areas that spread quickly. And this is something you'll want to highlight with a marker or some sort of uh, pen. You know, measure the wound, see if it's growing. If it's growing quickly, you need to go in. Um, the later progressions change the color of the skin. There's pus, oozing in the infected areas, dizziness, fatigue. Performing a biopsy and taking tissues is, is one of the uh, gold standards for identifying necrotitis fasciitis. And looking at x-rays as well as ultrasounds in the damage area, you need antibiotics immediately, but that's not going to help because the tissue is devascularized. So the antibiotics won't reach there. You need to have surgical debridement and removed of the dead necrotic tissue. Okay. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. Any questions? We have one, well, we have one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We have one question here. Yeah. Uh, what's the best way to stop a massive hemorrhage? Massive hemorrhage. Okay, so you can you can do um, clamping. Pressure is usually number one. Keep pressure. You can do clamping. You can endovascularly. You can put a covered stent. Well, other than that, you know, you go from there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris, so nice job. I'd like to say uh, you've covered the entire conference already, so we might as well go home, right? Um, that's very well. Well done. Uh, I'd like to say again that it's important for us to encourage our young uh, medical students and residents to participate in uh, patient care and, and presentations so they become uh, very familiar with uh, the um, hard work necessary for us to uh, pro uh, progress to get, take care of our patients. Uh, in wound care, like I said, it's an essential part of uh, vascular surgery and endovascular surgery. Many of these patients uh, end up having intervention uh, because they have arterial-based uh, problems or venous-based problems that may require intervention. One of the things that I see uh, usually with patients with wound, wound, wound care, needing wound care as uh, the dresses are put on and they're told not to take a shower. I find that really interesting because if you have a dirty wound, uh, you just breed more bacteria if you don't take a shower. So if the wound does not does not have a graft, that, that a skin graft that you protect in the first few days, uh, really those wounds should, once you take a shower, clean the wound, soap and water is the best treatment, I think, uh, uh, before any other additional dressings is applied. Uh, the wound care is really, really a big deal in 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 the U.S. as well as uh, in Africa. And the U.S. have wound care centers, um, uh, which uh, does uh, which do uh, um, uh, a lot of this care. And uh, private physicians also do that. But in the African context, it's a major problem, and we need to continue to improve wound care challenges that, that we have. Um, uh, next. Uh, if the, any questions from the audience, uh, from the uh, virtual audience, comments on Dr. Lambertus's uh, talk, and it's an opportunity for you to talk. Otherwise, we'll ask them, ask for for the comments during that discussion uh, phase of the talk. All right. So um, our next speaker comes to us. Here yes, from... I have a question, sir. Oh, sure. Okay, Dr. Daffy, go ahead. Go yes. Ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is, uh, thank you very much. Very nice and wonderful discussion. So my question is, um, is there any role in the use of vitamin D in wound care? Uh, vitamin D is an essential um, a mineral. So um, in, 
in wound care, generally speaking, one must have adequate levels of vitamin D. If they're low in vitamin D, you have to replace it, of course. We do know that uh, low levels of vitamin D would lead to fatigue and all the others. So as part of uh, overall health care of the patient, uh, your vitamin D levels should be normal. There are some wound care products that okay. use vitamin E and vitamin D um, that don't have a problem with that. And if, in as much as the, uh, the wound um, is clean, and as much as the wound um, uh, is debrided adequately, um, all those, the good debridement is the first step of good wound care. Uh, and um, when you talk about debridement, there are different ways to debride wounds. We have mechanical debridement with uh, scalpel and um, scissors. We also have non-mechanical means, uh, such as uh, water-based, uh, ultrasound-based uh, techniques that can clean the wounds much better. But vitamin D products, E products are certainly reasonable if the wound is clean. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Defe. Okay, our, our next speaker comes to us here from Beckley, West Virginia. Uh, she's a renowned um, um, foot and ankle surgeon who uh, takes care of my complicated cases and our, our complete cases in our institution. Uh, she's well-trained and uh, quite active in patient care. Uh, she uh, does excellent work with, uh, uh, with uh, wounds and uh, she is uh, a vibrant, active uh, consultant in uh, foot and ankle surgery right here at Raleigh General Hospital. I speak no other than to call to the podium, Dr. Ezekiel, Chinaye Ezekiel. Thank you, Dr. Chinaye. All right, we're gonna load this up. Yeah, it's okay. Like date modified, yeah, that one, the first one. Mm -hmm. I think we can bring the screen a little down. Yes. Little down. I really like zooming out. Yeah. That's what they say. Okay, great. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Dr. Chinenya Ezike. I'm a foot and ankle specialist here at Raleigh General um, Hospital in Beckley. So um, today I'll be discussing strategies uh, to offload the diabetic ulcer and how we can you can incorporate the strategies in your practice. So conservatively, um, you can offload diabetic ulcers uh, with the gold standard known as total contact casting system. Essentially, it involves um, using a specific type of cast material while maintaining the foot at 90 degrees. And what the total contact cast does is it helps transfer about 40% of weight uh, to the tibia. Other options for conservatively offloading um, diabetic ulcers, you can use a surgical boot, otherwise known as a controlled ankle motion boot. And there are various types of darker wedge shoes. For example, this here demonstrates um, a four foot offloading um, wedge shoe. Now, sometimes um, with this conservative measures, you know, it can be, you know, inadequately offloading the plantar foot ulcers. And sometimes it just, um, patients are non-compliant with utilizing these devices. And then specifically with the total contact casting, it requires someone who is very familiar with applying the cast to put it on. Um, so if conservative measures fail, we can explore the route of surgical um, offloading of the ulcerations. And I'm gonna go over uh, some case studies in the next uh, slides. So I'll be talking about floating metatarsal osteotomies and using an external fixator. So with floating metatarsal osteotomies, it's essentially um, 
where you go down to the bone of the metatarsal and you use either a sagittal saw or a burr and make a cut in the bone. So for example, in this patient, um, the patient had an ulcer on the bottom of his fifth metatarsal head. So you use a sagittal saw and just uh, make a cut in the bone and then translate the capital fragment dorsally to offload the plantar ulcer. Um, this is a study just showing the effect of floating metatarsal osteotomies on ulcers on the bottom of the metatarsal heads. And this study also looked at um, how much plantar pressure is decreased by doing this metatarsal osteotomy. So in this study, um, the author had 32 patients with diabetic foot ulcers, specifically under the metatarsal heads. And they found that after doing the metatarsal osteotomies, there was a decrease in uh, plantar pressures from 338 kilopascals to 225 kilopascals. And all the ulcers healed in about 3.7 weeks, all except um, one patient. So this is just um, an adaptation of the x-rays showing how the uh, metatarsal osteotomy heals. So in this case, the osteotomy was made at the fifth metatarsal neck. And then this is in a year, you can see um, the adaptation of the uh, fifth metatarsal, just the way the bone remodeled in this position. Okay. So let's go over some cases. Um, this is a 77 year old male who I was seeing um, in the wound care center. He had a history of a two year um, ulcer on the bottom of his fourth metatarsal head. Um, his diabetic with neuropathy, good pulses, doesn't smoke, um, but he had uh, diabetic neuropathy. So since February 2021 to September 2021, uh, we can see the progression of his wounds. And then I discussed with him at September 2021 about doing a metatarsal osteotomy to offload the ulcer. He was amenable to the plan. So this is on the um, intraoperatively, as you can see, I'm targeting the fourth metatarsal head and I'm making the osteotomy at the metatarsal neck using a burr. This is my incision placement. And um, in addition to this metatarsal osteotomy, I also did an Achilles tendon lengthening to reduce overall uh, pressure on the balls of the foot. This is one, one month postoperatively. As you can see, his ulcer pretty much has resolved to a post ulcerative lesion. And then this is six months after. It's like you can even you can barely even see the wound, the where the wound was. Case number two. Um, this was a pleasant 65-year-old gentleman who came into the hospital for an abscess on the bottom of his second metatarsal head. Um, he denied any precipitating trauma, but he did say that where that abscess was, there was a lot of callus in that area. He had uh, palpable pedal pulses, um, but on the left side, he had mild peripheral vascular disease, and the left foot is where he had the ulcer. MRI was obtained, and it showed that he had abscess and a soft tissue emphysema under the second and third metatarsals, and he also had some... Um, intrinsic muscle abscess as well. So this is just uh, some clinical pictures while the patient was in the OR. Upon debriding that ulcer, you can appreciate the abscess under the second slash third metatarsal head. I had to go in a little further and excavate um, necrotic tissue in the region. And then I saw him in the wound care center. This is from January, 2023 up until July. I mean, the wound did improve here, this is where I had applied a skin substitute graft. Nevertheless, July 5th, he had this, um, the ulcers resolved to this position and they were very difficult to, um, to heal. So we tried total contact casts and still the ulcer just maintained its position. And this also specifically under the submetatarsal four slash five probed to the cartilage. Like you can probe the cartilage um, from the wound. So I discussed with him just doing a metatarsal osteotomies from two to five, and he was open to that. So this is immediate post-op. So I just made a break in the bones from uh, the second metatarsal to the fifth, 
And then I I just push the heads of the metatarsals up, dorsally subluxing it. This is two months postoperatively. He's starting to form some callus development here. Clinically, this is nine days um, post-op and then five weeks post-op, he's also pretty much healed to just a small callus. And he's back in regular shoes. He's pretty excited. Um, third case, um, this is a guy, diabetic, neuropathy. He has some mental challenges. He's not very clean with his feet. Nevertheless, he had good pulses. He had an ulcer on the bottom of his fifth metatarsal head. His x-ray was negative for osteomyelitis. So I went in and did a fifth metatarsal osteotomy and translated the capital fragment um, upwards to offload the plantar fifth metatarsal uh, wound. So this is two weeks post-op, and then this is eight weeks post-op. He's pretty much, I, this is like, this is yesterday. He is pretty much healed. Okay, next up, we're moving on to using external fixator to offload um, ulcers in the bottom of the foot in the setting of diabetes. So this is this was a 68-year-old female uh, with diabetes, neuropathy, mild peripheral vascular disease. Uh, she was presenting with a one-month history of an ulcer on the bottom of her uh, left heel that was treated by her primary care physician. Um, when CTA was done, it showed that there was three vessel runoff and she was seeing a vascular doctor outpatient. One month into seeing her in the wound care center, this is how her wound looked. Um, it was necrotic. This right here is bone. And so um, x-rays did show that she had uh, osteomyelitis. So what I did for this lady was I told her to go to the ER so that she can be admitted and I can do surgical intervention clean the heel out and put an external fixator on. So for that kind of heel osteomyelitis, I employed what's called a silo technique. That's essentially after you resect the infected portion of the calcaneus, the heel bone, you make multiple drill holes in the heel. And then in those drill holes, you can put your antibiotic um, cement. And in my own case, I like to use uh, calcium sulfate and then mix it with um, gentamicin and vancomycin powder, just like that. So after doing that, I put her in an X-fix to offload the entire plantar heel. With this type of X-fix, she can actually walk on it because it has foot rails. So this was two months post-procedure, seeing her in the wound care center. It's starting to shrink. The bone was completely filled up with some granulation tissue. This is three months post-op. And then this is 3.5 months post-op. This has also has pretty much resolved into um, a callus and I removed the X-fix. All right, last case, similar um, issue. This lady was coming in with a two month history of an ulcer on the bottom of her uh, left heel, diabetic, neuropathy, gout. She has uh, coronary artery disease. As far as pulses go, both DP and PT pulses were palpable. Now this wound probed very close to bone. So we got x-rays and that was negative for osteomyelitis, which was good. So this was one month um, into doing serial debridements and local wound care at the wound care center. And then one week after this um, one month visit, they also looked like it was small, getting smaller in diameter, but it was still deep probing very close to bone. And as a matter of fact, it had formed a, a tunnel to the medial aspect of the foot. So this wound and this heel wound connected and there was pus emanating from this medial ankle ulcer. So I told her to go to the hospital so I can clean her out and put an X fix on her and she, um, she complied. So what I did in the OR was essentially connect those two ulcers together and clean out the tract and put a, a skin substitute graft. And I also put an X fix on. So this is one week post up. She has nice, healthy, um, beefy tissue. This is one month post up. It's getting much thinner. The X fix is still on. She's still use, utilizing the X fix. And then this is six weeks post up. The planter also has completely healed. And that uh, tract is pretty much a partial thickness wound 
at this point. This was her last um, uh, clinical picture. I'm gonna see her again uh, next week and I'm hoping that she'll be healed at that time. Here, the X fix is also off because she was like, I want it off, so I took it off. So that's it. So um, essentially, I discussed all these cases with you as um, a strategy for you to uh, possibly incorporate in your practice uh, for offloading very difficult uh, plantar foot wounds in the setting of diabetes. Any questions? Yeah, Dr. Uh, Dr. Zicke, I have a question. Yes. For the, uh, for the audience. Okay. Uh, what uh, skin substitute are you using and what, uh, how do you pick one substitute or the other? The other. So in the case of um, infected ulcers, we have um, a special type of graft that has PHMB. So what PHMB does is it attracts bacteria onto itself. And the name of that graft is uh, Puroply. That's what I use for infected wounds. But if the wound bed is clean, um, there are no signs of infection, there's no necrosis, I'll recommend using uh, dermal inductive type of graft. So those grafts have active stem cells. Um, I'll use those for very clean wounds that have stalled and have shown no progress despite four weeks of serial debridement. What about your know, patient have charcoal that already in wounds associated with charcoal? Have you mentioned? With uh, charcoal, it's very complex. So the key with charcoal foot is offload, 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 especially when they have a wound. Um, you can either tell them to remain non weight bearing on that leg, which most of them can comply. Or well, actually, the standard is put an X fix on them to offload that ulcer. Take them, take them to the OR, clean out that ulcer. But not only are you cleaning out the ulcer, you have to go under the ulcer and resect the bone where that ulcer is located to offload it. Any further questions? Do you think oxygen therapy would help with the healing? Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, um, unfortunately, there's no like level one studies to show that it is the primary treatment to heal ulcers. Well, based on my experience, it's good for wounds where that the patient has like poor microvascular disease, even though they have like good, you know, pulses, but they have microvascular disease, hyperbaric is just, it's very good for those kind of wounds. But there are no like sound studies to show. Hello, sir. This is efficacious. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. You're welcome. Dr. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hello. It has a question. I think that's the strategy. Is there any questions from the have a question. question. Oh yes, yes, okay. yes. My question is, um, what do you use? Because I've listened to your presentation. Thank you, uh, Chidima. I've listened to your presentation. The issue here, if if you want to translate this to uh, low resource setup in our like in what we have here in Nigeria, uh, how can you follow up track this patient for this length of time? Because you know, patient doctor, you comes here to do cases. And he knows that there are uh, there are a lot of differences between uh, the behavior here and wherever uh, and your place there. So how are you going to track them to some of these um, uh, materials you mentioned? We don't have them here in low research setting. So how do we go about in addressing the same thing we uh, that you have there? If you have it here, how do we? How can we? How can we use? the little we have to achieve it? Well, if you have an operating room, um, I'm sure the operating room instruments include like either um, a mallet and an osteotome. You can use the osteotome and the mallet to break the bone. That's like the simplest tool you can use. It's gonna require a little bit more effort, but that's a tool you can use. Um, as far as follow-up, you got to tell the patient, you got to follow up every two weeks, then a month, and then three months, and then six months. And then you got to put the fear of God in them, telling them, you know, if you don't follow up, there's a chance you're going to lose your foot if things go south. Okay. Thank you very much. Welcome. Dr. Edith, otherwise you call the native doctor, right? <laughs> uh, All right. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vedette, for the question. 
Uh, our next uh, presentation. Uh, um, discussion. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, next uh, uh, item on the agenda is roundtable discussion. And so, at this point, the floor will be open to any questions you may have uh, regarding the, the talk topics um, already, and any other topic you, you may want to talk about. Uh, we could start with a simple question. If you could drop your answers in the chat, just a true or false, based on uh, Dr. Cristo, medical student's uh, presentation. So it's just an easy one to start off with the CME. True or false, paresthesias are a part of the six Ps of acute limb ischemia. So if you can type true or false in the chat. Yeah, or yes or no. Yes, thank you, thank you. And also, I just want to remind for anybody who's coming late, if you could put your email in the chat as well, or uh, you can send it um, directly to me. Who uh, My name is Yeti Gupta. You'll see that in the meeting. So I can just have your name down with your email for your CME credits. And yes, true is correct. So uh, based on Dr. Azike's presentation, is there anything uh, you would now incorporate in your practice regarding foot wounds or techniques? Start a podiatry program in your local hospital. Yep, Dr. Oye said start a podiatry program in your local hospital. Call Dr. Azike to come. Yeah, and Dr. Azike can consult for you. <laughs> by, by the way, um, along those lines, along those lines, we do have a a virtual platform of uh, consultants that you can um, seek their opinions on if you have complex cases in your environment. Uh, so again, that goes for vascular surgery and the vascular surgery. And since Dr. Zika is the prominent um, foot and ankle surgeon with great work um, results, we uh, also will like her to help us uh, help you with that process. Does anyone have any questions regarding any of the presentations this far? No. Okay. So the next presentation is a recording. Unfortunately, Dr. Piccolo could not make it today to do his present uh, presentation live. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, he uh, made a pre-recording for us for his topic, which is TCAR access tips and tricks. So I will play that for us right now. TCAR is transcarotid artery revascularization. It's um, up and coming way to do carotid surgery uh, where stents are placed in the carotid rather than doing standard carotid endidrectomy, which has been a gold standard for many years. We also have carotid artery stenting. Uh, which you can do via the femoral approach, or, um, and uh, that has some risk complications too. So TCAR is very up and coming. It's um, it's something that we could uh, use to set in practice uh, settings. It's important to know about the technology. Okie dokie, I'll select the presentation. <laughs> One minute. All right. Hello, my name is Dr. Tom Piccolo and I'm a vascular surgeon in South Carolina. I work at McLeod Heart and Vascular Institute and I'm honored to be here to discuss 
GCAR talking about access, tips, and tricks at the sixth annual end of asset in Africa and rural America. I have no disclosures, although I will say that Silk Road is the only commercial available company in the United States to perform TCAR. As we know, the safety and outcome of the TCAR are excellent. It has been shown throughout multiple studies. And if you compare them to long-term stenting trials and carotid artery trials, we know that long-term outcomes of carotid stents do quite well. We also know that the learning curve for TCAR is not exceptionally high, with it not taking very many cases to really get to expert level. And even in novice level, the risk for stroke is equivalent or even slightly less, depending on the significance of the underlying patient comorbidities than with open end arterectomy. As you know, technically there is no difference statistically between TCAR outcomes of stroke and cardiac arterectomy in the VQI. However, in high risk VQI patients, there is a statistical significance um, with TCAR. Now, TCAR has been opened up in America to be done on both low risk and high risk patients. And so some of this is going to probably be the next. I can tell you that McLeod Health, we have done a quite large number of TCAR. We have done 530 of these about procedures. I have personally been involved in around 170 of them, not only doing my own, but also being involved in the proctoring for others when they did the first five cases. We've had very good success here using t -Pump. As I see it, there are some pitfalls you have to be wary about with this, and we're going to go through them here. The first is access. I think access actually is one of the biggest things of the T car. Um, and I can show you that this is a kind of cartoon representation of how I do my access. I put a Ramel tourniquet on the common card already approximately. I put a red that's a little more distally. I find the area in between that, that's soft, and I access it there. I do this on every case, and I do this for several reasons. And the one is that with all other vascular surgery, we typically back bleed and forward bleed an artery and then flush it with heparinized saline solution. With the exception of how this is really taught from the company, where you just sew your purse string and pull out the sheet. I do not like the area down here between your clamp or your ramel and the sheet. I think, especially in soft plaque, because there is such significant flow reversal, things can get caught in there. I like to make sure that it's completely bled out and also completely de aired. It also helps because it gives the artery kind of further up in it. The wound so it's easy to get to. The wound so it's easy to get to. And it also helps us with stabilization, which I think is actually key when accessing it. So this happens to be an oblique disabled because this patient was more than obese. I have only done maybe two or three oblique incisions. Uh, most times I do transverse, but you can see how when you have both arteries, both parts of the artery controlled and, and lifted up. It's easy to get to, and also you can actually pull up on your red rubber slightly to allow some stabilization um, when you're putting in the, the sheet. The other thing I think is very big with access is that while we are looking at the vessel in the room, which may be a small portion, we know that there is some significant virtuosity sometimes with these patients. 
And we need to make sure that we're accessing the vessel in line, in parallel line with how the vessel is, is going um, in the neck. There are, um, you know, one of the biggest problems is the short run runway and getting access uh, to the carotid artery. There are different ones we're going to talk about here. Um, as we know, you know, the runway is really defined as the area of access to the lesion. So if you have like on the right side here, a completely wide open bifurcation external carotid artery, and you can drive the micro sheath and then eventually the stiff wire into that, you know, providing you have enough space within usually two and a half to three centimeters to get the honored low reversal neuroprotection sheath in is not much of a problem. It really becomes an issue when you have severe disease of the bifurcation and the origin of the external where you really can't do that. And so really it's not the distance from the from the clavicle to the bifurcation, but it's a distance from the clavicle to the actual disease. Anytime you have a length to death ratio of, of less than one to one, that's where I start to get concerned about, hey, do we have enough runway to get the on route sheet in safely and actually take care of This patient. So obviously lots of ways you can do that. The first thing to understand is that sometimes your CT position or even your carotid duplex, depending on who's doing it, if you have to have that in your office, you can really maximize that. Sometimes that evaluation is different than how the patient's going to be positioned on the operating table. Sometimes their chin is tucked as opposed to the neck is extended. And when that occurs, you actually can gain some more runway than you may not even Need to be, be as close as you can. Yes. We always maximize our position, especially when we're doing shot of whether it's an you know, open end or a right or two car. We traditionally use you know, some type of shoulder roll to help with that as well. There are Definitely elevation techniques to run with that. Again, I do this on every patient. I mobilize the artery. I have it controlled in multiple locations and I bring it higher up in the wound so I can you know, decrease my length to that. Um, ratio. And I do this on every case. There are others that do this x ray or bump technique which is drawn here to help get the artery up in there. I think if you have the artery mobilized, both distal and proximal to your access site, it pretty much does that for you, but it certainly adds a little bit of stabilization. Um, with shorter runways, there are things like tunneling the proximal loop. So sometimes we'll tunnel this loop to learn this thing below that which allows us to gain a little bit of length as well, especially because when the loop is inside the incision, you can kind of get stymied by the subcutaneous tissue, especially in cases where we're moving the loop. There certainly is the pre-clamp technique, it's not short. I've done that uh, numerous times where you set up with as much hyperextension as possible, tunnel your loop, do your full same T card timeout, get your micro sheep in, make sure you have good access and no dissection. And then at that time, making sure that your you know um, ACT is over 250, fully anticoagulated, clamp the proximal common carotid artery so there's no flow going into the brain, put your J wire on the sheep and finish the day as quickly and as normal as possible. And that works well as well. Um, this way, you don't have to worry about, you know, disruptions and disease in the common heart artery or around the bifurcation if there is a problem. Lastly, something we've done twice here, I've been a part of this twice, is doing a conduit. Obviously, this is not my uh, be all end all, but this is two out of 200, uh, 528 cases. This particular patient is 62 years old, morbidly obese, multiple medical comorbidities, previous cervical neck fusion, remote history of a 
CBA um, and then had another CBA um, and was told, you know, couldn't really be treated at outlying facilities, had yet another then right side of the current deficit, um, could not be a candidate for analytics, could not really uh, be a candidate for a traditional open cry, another I think given her morbid obesity, did not really move her neck very well because of her previous cervical neck fusion. Um, had a significant, you know, neurologic recovery from her even second stroke with a myofibrillar ranking of one, and certainly wanted to be treated. You can see here the MRI she had a previous old stroke on that side and has a new stroke as well. Um, and you know her depth was very, very, very deep over six uh, centimeters deep. Um, and you can see her neck fusion there. It's actually her neck fusion was so poor that it's actually difficult to get a good view of the disease on the bifurcation because of scatter. So here where we saw the eight millimeter dacron graph to around two centimeters of common quad artery that was relatively normal. Um, we put the sheath inside the graph so you don't have to even worry about putting the SIP wire right because you're putting the other sheet straight into the dacron graph. Procedure through this, and you can kind of see here the profunda clamp just below that. You can see that you know, it's a very limited amount of length between the area that we sewed the graft on and the bifurcation with the disease. This doesn't look as bad in the external here, but actually, there was three centimeters of soft plaque at the bifurcation that we didn't want to cross. Um, you can see a really bad disease going up into the hill there. Um, and then that was the completion picture. And you can see here on the ton on the um, duplex, this is uh, three months later. You can see that's about as much of the conduit we over so that that's about as much as we have left. It's almost like a patch in that location. And the patient had very good velocities and did very well. The, the next problem we have with TCAR, I think, is really to be classified as more dynamics. And that's really one of two problems. It's either a sudden flow in the neuroprotection system or it's the hemodynamic storing and your platform. Incentive. I think, you know, when we talk about sluggish flow, it's usually one of two problems either the equipment or the patient in the dynamics. So the first thing to do is looking at these stop costs on your NPS, um, on the on your system here, actually. And you want to make sure these are straight in line with the ports because even if they're off just a little bit, they can really narrow the lumen and stop. Now, supposedly, um, sometime next, next year, they're going to come out with a, a new um, one of these where the, those ports actually click into place. And so you, you're not going to have the chance to really move them in inadvertently and they'll be, you know, maximally open. The next is the tuning itself, you know, making sure this is not tuned. You usually don't have a problem with that, especially if you go to the contralateral femoral vein. Certainly, if it's on the ipsilateral side, because there's some kind of problem over here, you have to be aware of that. Uh, the next is to make sure the ports are connected all the way um, and make sure they click in place. Um, after that, it's really the arterial sheath. You can really do two views of the tip of the sheath to make sure you're not a button. 
through the wall. I'll tell you that this really goes back to access zone, so we're understanding the torch velocity of the vessel and the direction where you're sticking the artery. As long as you're parallel in the vessel, there shouldn't be a problem. And the last thing is, you know, where there's a problem with the vein sheet. So you've got to make sure you're definitely in the vein, obviously, because it's not going to work very well if you have arterial flow this is going into. Sometimes you can be against the valve, you can pull back a little bit, sometimes you can flush the sheet. Make sure it's not clotted. Um, and, you know, sometimes it cannot be fully clamped. And what you can really do is you take a general angiogram under the floor and now actually take the stop button to make sure that the contrast is turning well into the arm of sheet. And I've done that sometimes when you're not sure if you got all the way across the vessel, is it good enough slow flow? Is it good enough flow reversing or not? You can really see that it washes out really quickly. And sometimes you don't see much. I guess well enough being trying to cry at all from like the stop button, but really shows you have a slight floor. First one. Um, if you have four femoral veins um, by laterally, there's different ways you can do this. I have done this once in the open carotid with a distal disease where you can actually place the sheet uh, integrated in the jugular vein with a fibro arch and suture. It does work very really well. Now, um, and then after the equipment and the vein, it's really the patient's being dynamic. So you really need to maximize all that you can, making sure the blood pressure is up to 160 to 180, making sure your HT is over 250. Um, and once in a while, you'll see that you don't have great, you know, return of flow, um, reversal of flow initially, or sluggish flow in, in the NPS because you have such severe ICA lesion that actually even from the back room, from the internal carotid, it can't get through that lesion. And until you actually open up the bifurcation, you, you know, especially if it's in the distal common part artery, you don't actually see too much back room whatsoever. And I've seen that quite uh, a bit with very significant disease. We do have patients that can be intolerant to clamping prior to intervention. Um, I've done a fair number of these awake with local. Um, obviously, we better try to increase the blood pressure, increase that FiO2. You can precondition the patient by clamping and unclamping a couple of times. That does seem to help. Obviously, general anesthesia itself decreases the length of brain metabolic uh, demands, and that can help. And you can also toggle between low and high reversal, and uh, you know, only putting it on high during the most crucial time. So when you're placing the scent and doing the balloon, having it on high when you're not having it on low. Um, and obviously, you kind of try to complete the procedure efficiently. Already control. You certainly have to worry about plaque prolapse, especially in soft plaque. Sometimes it takes multiple views to make sure that it's not, you know, it's, it's behind the stent, not inside the stent. Once in a while, you have to place a second stent to make sure you have good lamin and flow that nothing through, especially if you have to both silate. Um, and you kind of just have to know your risk and be cautious. And that's really done on your preoperative evaluation with your CAT scan. So we know that the clotted plaque composition actually does predict subsequent cardiovascular events. Isenosis, especially with using chronic extension. And there's multiple papers, but the units usually around Halstein means around 36 or so. So if you have Halstein units, on average of less than 36, it's very soft. Those are the ones that have a higher risk of plaque prolapse, getting through your stent and having problems. Um, this has been shown in numerous studies, numerous times uh, throughout the years and, and looking at the unfavorable plaque in that location. Um, you know, I will tell you that um, the C CMO, uh, Silk Road talks about this polo mint sign. So for those of you who are unaware, polo mints are similar to lifesavers in the U.S., where you have less candy and more of the, the hole, um, as opposed to our lifesavers here in America with less candy. And so anytime you have this polo mint sign on tax can, you have to worry about the thrombus, the chance of it going through the stand. Having a problem. And this is, you know, typically described even before carotid disease and carotid dilation and PVE, where you have that kind of polo sign. And we see that in the internal carotid artery as well. When you have those, I, my bias really 
Davis can be open and not elected me unless there's some reason you cannot, because I I want to get that fresh from this list at, uh, for ones that have a list to go through the set app. So here's another clinical case of a 83 year old left upper extremity weakness, left lower extremity weakness. Pacemaker was present in his not compatible MRI, EF at 30%, bilateral, very high grade. Oh, Polyxenosis, very soft plaque, with some calcification, very high lesion with you know a standard you know, deviation somewhere around 30. Um, um, you know, um, The plaque here on the Houndsdale units. You can actually see in this picture here, um, you can see I had to place two stents and the length of lesion was so long, but you can see this piece of the stent here is going up, and that's actually things that were eluded through that stent. That's not even with post the patient. And so you have to be very aware of that, that you're going to get some of that, and sometimes you have to, have to cover it, which we cover here. So this is that picture of that patient. This is what came out of the flow reversal, which was one of the worst ones I've seen of 170 I've done, um, where we get a, sometimes a lot of this stuff out. And a lot of times people say, well, we don't really see that because we do transdermal stenting. We don't see that much stuff in the filter. And I really think it's because you really need to be um, pretty passive aggressive with your pre balloon rotation to make sure you clear all of that soft stuff so it doesn't have a chance to go through your stent. And you have very good flow reversal to allow that to happen. So usually I balloon to the level of the ICA. So this is four and a half, at least four and a half. If it's five, at least five. If it's 4.8, sometimes I usually use five. And I try to make sure we get all of this almost disrupted and have it come out so it doesn't, you know, lead to your have a problem. So again, make sure you know your sense fully you're evaluated in multiple views. Uh, once in a while, um, you have to sometimes do a stent graft. Um, I have never had to do this in a traditional, you know, cryostenosis. You know, understand that you have an eight front sheet and no uh, stent graft here available. I will tell you that the wire that you have for silk road is not good enough because the run over these are rapid exchange, not over the wire. It's over the wire stent graft, not rapid exchange stent. I want to do it here, and I can tell you this is a seven-year-old gentleman that I did a while back who came in with right upper extremity weakness and numbness, had actually multiple events of this, um, and um, so I had a couple of episodes of this. He has pretty significant history. He had previous carotid trauma and a previous endorectomy over 19 years ago and then 10 years ago with no records, not really done here. Um, had a very hard in the neck, not one year is going to be amenable to going back and doing a third carotid procedure on this patient. Was already on aspirin and plivix and statin. Was watched closely in the hospital to make sure there's no risk for hemorrhage because of how severe the findings were. Um, and talked about doing this. We had to kind of think about our preoperative concerns, which were the need for the longer wire, the thought rapid exchange, making sure we have toothpaste and thrombus, making sure we don't have any endoids from the ECA uh, or the type 2, making sure you know, get rid of all the floating thrombus, and you know, making sure that you know, we do this as safe as possible. So here's a gentleman, here's a We had pretty step average stroke, multiple error. Uh, but certainly seem to be. Maybe. We'll conclude Dr. Piccolo's presentation. He
provided us with an ample amount of case studies, which we are thankful for, but to keep things rolling along, uh, next we'll have Dr. Ray Bio. Um, and if anyone has questions for Dr. Piccolo, you can email them to me and I will send them forward to him. So we thank him for his presentation and um, we will have Dr. Bio next. Dr. Bio, are you here? Dr. Ray? Yep, he's right there. All right. I am. All right. Yes, I'll... I am. All right. I'll send my phone for you. Yes, if I will. Can... Yes, I will put your presentation up. Yeah, while your presentation is coming on, Dr. Bio. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation to speak. Uh, Dr. Bayer is a cardiovas cardiovascular surgeon, cardiothoracic surgeon in Lagos and uh, Nigeria. And he will be talking to us today about vascular experiences in his practice. I'm just sharing the screen, doctor, and we will start in a second. All right. You're good to start, doctor. Thank you, ma. I will be talking about vascular injury and disease I experience. Um, looking at cases between the year 2022 and 2023, I will be following this outline and introduction and methodology case theory, um, a little discussion, conclusion. Next slide, please. Vascular injury, of course, when the vessel is traumatized, either by a blunt or penetrating force, resulting in partial or complete future in service. Majorly, there are two types, either the blunt or the penetrating. Some are the third category, the combination of blunt and the penetration. So it's basically a prospective study of cases with sorry, our institution, which is the Federal Medical Center of Medical between 2022 and 2022. The cases were still from the electronic medical record of the hospital. We had <clears throat> about eight cases in all, but out of these, I like, selected just to be the first story morning or afternoon, depending on where we are. Next slide, please. Mr. Bichi is a 43 year old man. He was being managed by the nephrology unit of the hospital for chronic kidney disease. Um, he was regular on hemodialysis at the hospital facility. However, due to distance and um, financial constraints, he had some sessions of hemodialysis at the private facility, different from our own hospital. Um, he developed complications and started having pain in his right lower limb. Next slide, please. Um, he eventually presented to the hospital with complaints of pain and progressive swelling around the bone region, <clears throat> which later involved the entire right lower limb of about three months duration. Pain was considered in onset, but progressively worse in the interior. Next slide. There was uniform increase in size of the right lower limb. There was inability to bear with in the affected limb. He said pain was transiently relieved by injection of an object.
Are you still with us, doctor? <laughs> Dr. Ray? Dr. Bio, are you still there? We'll give him a minute. So before he comes back, you're looking at the common femoral artery in that out pouch on the right side, suggestive of um, a compressive phenomenon. So that would have led to maybe some form of uh, DBT, maybe we find out if that's the case in front we're yeah. talking about exploration of the right lower limb. Dr. Bio? Oh. He may be having a network problem. Yeah. This is one, one exploration. And this uh, comes to the Anders and men like it should be the Shalit. And uh, they put a thermal catheter, a total catheter. And they had no more like private, it's not like artery. That's findings and uh, large pseudo Anders. But block block the right thermal area. But that's a fair amount of blood at 1.5 meters. Interesting. The question is whether or not he may have had an access put in the right side of the groin um, and they may have missed the vein and had the artery. They put the sheet on it and cost two Next one. Yeah, the amount of uh, injury to the right from the artery, 60 cm is a lot of area. Well, this is beyond, uh, this is beyond uh, cover extent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next one, we can also go back. There was evacuation of the clot here. There was ligation of the AV fistula connection. And Dr. Bio was able to repair of the rent in the right femoral artery. So in the histology specimen, uh, it showed a foci of necrotic tissue with mixed inflammatory infiltrate seen. There was no atypia or foci or malig of malignancy seen. The wound was healed and the patient followed up at the nephrology clinic. Dr. Bio, are you still with us? I'm guessing he has some connection problems, so I'll continue his presentation for him. His second patient is a 41-year-old diabetic who presented with inability to bear weight for three years. He was being managed as a case of diabetic neuropathy by the physicians. This patient then developed gangrene of the left D2. He was offered a left below knee amputation, which he rejected. This patient's CT angiography showed a complete interruption of the left femoral artery. The patient was offered a left femoral popliteal artery bypass, and he had surgery. So during the surgery, the intraoperation findings include pulseless superficial femoral artery, weak abs, almost absent pulses of the left common femoral artery, and he had a left femoral femoral artery bypass using an eight millimeter PTFE graft and embolectomy of the left femoral arteries. So for this patient, the outcome post-op recovery was associated with ileus. 
This patient had a transabdominal but retroperitoneal route in attaining proximal vascular control. Further recovery was uneventful, and he has been on regular dialysis and outpatient visits, outpatient dialysis visits. So the second patient still complains of rest pain in the left foot, and the Doppler ultrasound done today showed no flow through the eight millimeter PTFE graft. So discussion. Penetrating injuries to the extremities account for five to 15% of traumas. Vascular injury accounts for 1% of all traumatic injuries to the extremities. Our institution is not a trauma center. Dr. Bio's institution is not a trauma center, hence the low number of cases. Pseudoaneurysm is a co common complication in patients who are on hemodialysis. Reports suggest an incidence of 5% up to 60%. Etiology may be from puncture, infection, or needling. Treatment is dictated by the etiology or the severity. Our patient, uh, Dr. Bio's patient, had a large ruptured pseudoaneurysm necessitating surgical intervention. The in incidence of peripheral vascular disease is also on the increase in Africa. Late presentation is the norm, and patients are commonly referred offered amputation. The endovascular conference is beneficial to the patients as the collab collaboration has been immense help. The aim of presenting was to highlight our challenges and seek further collaboration. Vascular injury and disease frequently lead to limb and life loss in this part of the world. The proliferation of endovascular skill and knowledge will reverse the trend and by collaboration through conferences like this. We're sorry you had connection issues, Dr. Bio, but we are happy to help you finish your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bio's presentation is really good and uh, the pictures are really, really nice. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to see him soon and uh, see how we can help uh, uh, improve uh, the uh, vascular endovascular experiences in his, at this institu institution. Uh, again, uh, this question, okay, go ahead. One question from Dr. Adafe was, can that patient benefit from endovascular cover stent? Uh, Dr. Adafe was asking if that patient in question could have benefited from endovascular stent. I, I think uh, based on what I've seen, there was 16 cm rent in the vessel, so it's less likely that would be the case. Um, for you to have an vascular closure, it's possible if you have a, um, a limited area of injury, you can put a covered stent, but uh, at that level may probably be difficult, especially if it's over the femoral artery, we really oh, um, joint, uh, joint area. We simply don't like putting stents over the joint area because of a possibility of kinking of stents. Uh, I guess uh, this case was uh, quite um, extensive. Dr. Bio's case is quite extensive. Uh, there's no question that the patient needed surgery, as we could see from the amount of blood clots that, that were retrieved uh, from the surgical site. But yes, there's a role for endovascular intervention and stenting in certain cases. Uh, it depends on the extent of the injury. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that will move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Edafe. Uh, who is uh, a consultant, um, cardio interventional cardiologist in um, Nigeria. He works out of um, the uh, University of Port Harcourt Teaching Hospital and also is a consultant for the Biosa Special Hospital as well as Save the Life uh, Hospital in Port Harcourt. Dr. Def is quite versed in um, intervention of the um, heart. Um, and uh, he's uh, very interested and does a lot of pacemaker work and also does some limb salvage um, interventions. We're grateful that Dr. Defe will be giving us two talks back to back. Uh, we will start with his first talk and he will swing on to the second talk uh, to full conclusion. The topics for his talk are the first one, endovascular intervention of critical limb ischemia in low resource settings case studies, and the second will be acute limb ischemia interventions in low resource environments, case studies. Dr. Defer, you're on, you're on, thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much for the kind word. Uh, my teacher, Dr. Oye, it's uh, nice to be here. Uh, I think you need to enable me to share my slides. I believe you are able to share your slides. No, it has not given me. It said host disabled uh, participant from sharing. How so if you can just make me a co-host, I'll be able to share. Yeah, I can share now. Thank you very much. Of course. Great. Okay, so in the next 20, uh, 10 minutes each, the two talks will cover 20 minutes. Uh, I'll be talking about um, uh, endovascular uh, interventions uh, of critical limb ischemia in low resource uh, setting. Then also, I'll also discuss uh, uh, cases about uh, acute limb ischemia. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Oye, for the privilege to be part of this meeting. So uh, the most severe form of peripheral artery disease include critical limb ischemia and acute limb ischemia. So critical limb ischemia refer to the condition characterized by uh, chronic ischemia at Dr. rest, Dr. pain, Dr. Also, Dr. Yeah. You cannot see your pictures. Can you, can you hear me? We can, can hear you, but we can't see your pictures. We can hear you, but we can't. Okay. So just one minute. Can and. I'll I'll take care of it. Okay. Can I go ahead? Uh, hold on one minute so we can make sure everyone can see your slides and I'll let you know when oh. to be in just a minute. Just hold on one second. Yeah. Yeah. If you want me to stop the sharing and reshare again, I can do so. We're just seeing if we could fix it on our end and then you'll be fine. Okay. Okay. We are seeing slides with um, words, <clears throat> no images. So I don't know if they, they seem to match what he was saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we're good to go. Okay. Is he okay now? Yeah. yeah. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, at, at the there are two major form of. Uh, uh, of severe peripheral artery disease, uh, which may be in the form of uh, critical limb ischemia or acute limb ischemia. Critical limb ischemia, uh, a group of uh, patients may present with uh, pain at rest, uh, usually start with claudication that progress to pain at rest, ulcer or gangrene uh, in, uh, in the affected uh, limb. So critical limb ischemia uh, implies chronicity and is being distinguished from acute limb ischemia that is uh, due to either uh, a thrombus formation in situ or embolic uh, uh, embolization from a distal point, uh, either from the heart, uh, probably people with uh, uh, chronic um, uh, atrial fibrillation, those that have a dilated cardiomyopathy, and if the heart forms of valvular heart disease or who had mechanical um, uh, valves and they were not properly being anticoagulated and they now form a clot and that clot can migrate down and get to the limb and occlude uh, the vessels of the limb. And such group of people, they present with uh, acute limb ischemia. So the diagnosis algorithm for this group, uh, two groups are a little bit separate for the critical limb ischemia. You look at the ankle breaker index, the toe index, or 
uh, you can also look at the uh, the oxygen uh, uh, saturations around the uh, the big toe or the perfusion, uh, the skin perfusion. So the treatment of critical ischemia is usually multidisciplinary. Uh, uh, you have the um, the interventional cardiology with vascular uh, experience in vascular interventions. The vascular surgeons. I've learned so much from uh, Dr. Oye in this regard, uh, the podiatrician, uh, then you also talk about the endocrine, depend on uh, what are the comorbidity of that patient. Uh, so these, it is this teamwork that we are talking about in this uh, part of the, of the world that we're low research set, uh, setting where we don't have all that we need to address uh, the need of this patient. So to revascularize uh, this group of people, there are three things that we must bear in mind. Either surgical revascularization has been discussed so far in the meeting, uh, and the vascular revascularization can also stand on its own, or a hybrid can be given to such group of uh, a patient where we combine surgery and, um, and uh, endovascular way of opening up the, uh, the vessel. So let me uh, just share some uh, cases of critical ischemia very quickly. Uh, uh, this patient, the case one, case number one, is a 67 year old who was diagnosed three years ago with um, uh, with uh, diabetic uh, uh, type two diabetic uh, ulcer. He presented with claudication uh, at uh, later progressed to uh, uh, pain at rest around the calf region. The Doppler that was done before referral to us showed that the lower part of the propria there is a point of critical stenosis. And the patient presented to us, Dr. Ye was in the cat lab that day. And uh, you can see here that this patient has, this is the anterior, almost the, uh, the prosma part of the anterior uh, tibia artery is uh, almost 99% uh, uh, occluded here. And uh, here, we did uh, pass the uh, the wire over it, and we ballooned, and with uh, a good result. Now, the issue about summarizing this particular case is that one is that most of this pain lasts for a long time before they present in our environment. Uh, then two is that this is below knee, uh, and most time we don't use uh, stents in below knee because they don't do very well. So it is only balloon we did here. The aim of doing this balloon is that you can see that patient may have collateral formation. And uh, if we have um, access, constant access to rotor ablator and that can size such a vessel, that can also be done uh, for this particular uh, patient. So the next patient is uh, a 77 year old uh, lady with. Uh, woman with type 2 uh, uh, diabetes and hypertension for about 20 years. He presented with bilateral lower limb uh, uh, pain and ulcers, and the ankle breaker index of both limbs uh, was uh, 0.7. Now, this was the <clears throat> this was the case. Yeah. Sorry. OK. So this was the, uh, the ulcer at presentation with uh, pain at on both lane. Uh he will come back in a minute. I believe he just had a network problem. Back. We are, certainly do know that it's a problem um, having resources to match the extent of disease profile in some of this uh, uh, rural settings or uh, some um, um, countries that don't have the ability or hospitals around the world that don't have the ability to provide endovascular care. Uh, Dr. Adafi does good work, excellent work uh, in that regard, even when limited resources. 
Uh, and um, fortunately for that patient, I had to be around when that happened with the first case and we were able to simply uh, improve the flow with uh, just plain balloon angioplasty and with excellent flow. So we did not have to do anything beyond that. And I experienced um, in Beckley, West Virginia and Southern West Virginia, uh, we find that stenting in the femoral popliteal segment and, and below the popliteal segment does not yield as much in terms of long long term results. Uh, in terms of uh, dur durability, we tend to favor just angioplasty alone for our patient population. We use stenting as a bailout procedure only in persons with severe dissection or patients who do not have um, who have um, significant recoil post angioplasty. Uh, we are using uh, new, nowadays we using atherectomy options. Uh, again, we also do have, as we'll talk later on, IVL therapy, um, intravascular lithotripsy option also. All these techniques um, and um, um, uh, consumables we use for endovascular intervention are quite costly. And uh, so for, for, for patients in a low, low resource center, it becomes problematic because you just can't afford it. Um, and so the goal is how we're going to uh, improve or uh, expand and enhance endovascular care at the same time, make it uh, affordable. We'll discuss that uh, as the conference goes on. But uh, that, that, that uh, has definitely uh, has presented some really thought-provoking, good examples of uh, what endovascular surgery should look like um, in a low resource center. The question is getting the equipment and consumables to uh, treat those patients. Uh, we will give them about one more minute to come on board. Uh, any questions from the audience in the meantime? Oh, he's back. Okay, Dr. is back, I guess. Dr. Edef, are you there? Dr. Edef, uh, I think you may need to switch your sound on. You are muted. There you yes. go. Thank you. So what we did for this patient was that we revascularized her. Yeah. So this was the at uh, the angel, uh, and after this we we ballooned and we are we continued this patient on medication. Then at three months post off. Uh, the two ulcers in both legs were healed. So case three is a 42-year-old man. He's not diabetic or hypertensive. Uh, he's sleeping with marginally uh, uh, above normal. Uh, he has a 12-year pack history of smoking. And um, uh, he has uh, some numbness in the foot, which progressed to uh, dusting, uh, discoloration of the feet. So when he presented to us and we did the angiogram and uh, we found out that he had a total occlusion of the anterior tibia uh, artery and which we went in and revascularized. Uh, after the balloon, we found out that the, that point of, uh, of the occlusion, it was the tightly stenosis. So we put uh, four by, it was four by, uh, by 15 millimeter uh, stent, uh, post into the uh, into that point of occlusion, and the patient was fully revascularized. This is before and this is after. He was fine and he returned back to his work. You can see that. So the huge here is that even though we don't use stents below uh, the knee uh, uh, routinely, sometimes you may have a knee. Uh, to put a stent, and your decision making is very important. So, case four is 76 year old man with his chemical disease, also type lipidemia. He had um, this patient had a bypass um, uh, seven years ago, and he now presented with uh, with chest pain and tightening of the chest. 
So what we did was that we decided, that, oh, let's go back and look at the bypass uh, uh, vessels and see whether there is any trouble. And see, we came from the femora and see what we saw here, a very tight stenosis of the uh, the left uh, subgravian artery just before uh, the lima was given up. And the question here is that what will be your approach here? Uh, we have already had a sheet from the femora. So what we did was that we took that sheet and uh, we took uh, a breeder sheet and went up as most close to the ostium of the uh, of the left subclavian, and we deploy a self uh, uh, we deploy a stent a self expanding stent and balloon it, and we got good result. The pain resolved because after that the circulation to uh, to the lima become uh, fantastic, and that was how that patient was treated. Case and uh, the next case, which is case five, is a patient. Uh, this was a very critical case. Uh, a Jehovah Witness. Uh, who was on the dialysis for chronic kidney disease. And uh, why in one of the section of dialysis, uh, this man uh, went uh, for femoral, it was a femoral cannulation. It, it was a mis mistakenly went Dr. Jaffe, there's a, a problem Asa, that tell that told us that it was the common femoral artery and um, the superficial femoral artery that was cannulated. But no surgeon could take this patient, and the patient was bleeding. There's another network problem. Uh, he should be back in a minute. I'm sorry. Any questions so far on Dr. Defer's presentation since he's having some uh, technical difficulties from the audience? Virtual audience. Yes. You said we don't place stents normally below. Is that something that's still? Well, you can, but the long-term patency is not as good. Uh, you usually um, from the femoral up, you have ninety to ninety-five percent patency. Uh, from the femoral to the knees, you have about sixty percent. Below is less than forty percent. I think it's muted. Dr. I think you're muted. Mm -hmm.
fingertips. Yeah. Looks like that. That's just muted. Dr. Adafi, I think you're muted. You can unmute. Sorry, I did not know. I didn't know. Sorry. So the aculum ischemia is as a result of clots, uh, either as a thrombus or uh, something uh, is happening in this uh, uh, institute, the artery is diseased and clot formation occurred around there. So the first case in aculum ischemia here is a 60-year-old uh, man with a sudden onset of rest pain in the right lower limb and coldness that ascended from the feet into, uh, into the, uh, the ankle and the knee region. And he quickly, because aculum ischemia is not something you can joke with, he quickly rushed down to the hospital and... Uh, when we took the angel, you can see that, uh, no, this patient spent almost five days before getting to us. So we took the angel, we noticed that he had a huge an aneurysm. Number one, the femoral cause, uh, the, uh, the iliac and femoral cause is abnormal with a huge uh, aneurysm which uh, appearing in form of kidney shape. You can see it here in form of kidney shape here on this patient, and uh, we tried to revascularize, uh, but what happened is that he still end up having below knee amputation. So case number two, a 47 year old man, uh, diagnosed for about six years with diabetes and also have um, parosisma AF for about six months. He presented with uh, coldness of sudden coldness of the, uh, of the left limb and also uh, pain along the track and uh, Thank God Oye was around that day and uh, we went into the uh, the cat labs and let me show you what we did before we come back here. This is what uh, Dr. Oye brought for us. And you can also see another suction machine here. These are all uh, cloth suctioning that Dr. Oye brought. So we did the, uh, you can see this is the, yeah. You can see where the cut happened, just distal SFA totally occluded from the distal SFA. So filled up with cloth. And you can also see here, so we did a lot of sucking from the cloth. Then uh, we use a rotor ablator with thrombot aspiration. Um, and we sucked out so much of that cloth. And we went in a balloon and also sucked out, give tenete place. So multiple mechanisms we are used to achieve a total revascularization of that limb. And the patient is good and healthy uh, today. So discussion here is that the use of ro uh, rotational arterectomy and thrombos uh, suction devices are needed here, uh, but they are not frequently or routinely available. Thank God for the service of Dr. Ye in our low research setting. So the next case is 64 year old woman, not diabetic, uh, hypertensive for about 10 years, uh, presented with sudden onset of rest lower limb pain of, and coldness of the extremity. And the Doppler shows that the patient had thrombites. And the patient took about five days before presenting to Ross at the Biasa Specialist Hospital. And um, uh, Dr. Shelley and I went in. Here, what we had was a forgotten catheter. So the, uh, the vascular surgeon exposed at the uh, level of the knee that is below uh, uh, the, the, at the level of the knee, and we have to take clots from uh, uh, below and from above. Uh, but when we are doing that, we observe one thing: the the vessel was not healthy. There are a lot of plaques and a lot of mutations, a, a lot of uh, atherosclerotic plaque on that particular vessel. So this patient also end up having a lower limb. Uh, sorry, below lean amputation, even after this, this procedure. These are some of the clot that we sucked up. We went in twice. We did the first one, revascularized, clot formation again. We went back, the same thing. So he has to go for that. So 
Um, this is also another patient at the Biasa Specialist Hospital. Uh, this one is a 87 year old um, um, a man uh, who presented with um, sudden onset of coldness of the left limb. The entire limb was totally uh, blanked off. There was no position at any point of the examination of the uh, left uh, lower limb. And um, what we went for the uh, ultrasound, and the, there was the artery was there, but there was no position filled up with clots. So we went in, uh, used our Fogate catheter uh, after the exposure, uh, uh, this general surgeon and I, after the exposure, we, sorry, the vascular surgeon and I, after the exposure we, of the uh, superficial femoral artery, we went in and extract as much clot as we can. You can see part of the clot that was extracted here. Thank God we survived, this patient survived, and um, uh, he went home successfully. So this is a, a part of the Fogarty character that, that we use. So uh, peripheral artery disease and its extreme presentations like uh, critical limb ischemia and aquilim ischemias are common in our environment in Nigeria here. Advances in treatments are valuable. Some of them are valuable thank, uh, thanks to the effort of Dr. Oye and all that he's doing with his team and with us here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Odafe, for very interesting uh, case presentations. Um, so, we're, we're thankful for your uh, continued um, um, persistence in helping those patients. As we well know, uh, limb, um, limb issues uh, leading to amputations uh, occur when patients present late in their course of uh, um, uh, in, in their course. Uh, so your ability to sometimes rescue them is there. Sometimes it's not possible when they come so late. Uh, we um, also are quite uh, um, concerned that the endovascular technology in terms of uh, intervention and availability of resources are not all there for, for you to have all you need in your toolbox. And that's why we're having yes, such as this. So we can continue to hopefully have uh, others um, uh, help us um, improve uh, the, the content of our toolbox. I will talk about that in my um, keynote speech. Uh, so again, great, great, great job. We're very appreciative of what you do for, for the people in Nigeria. Thank you so much. Any questions for Dr. Dapper? Okay. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hey, yes, thank sir. you, Dr. Dapper. Nice you job. Much, great job. Yes, I, will, I will talk to you some more. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. You, sir. <laughs> yeah, at this yes, point, sir. at this point, we'll have a hell of a break. We'll have a 15-minute break and we'll rejoin. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I Thank would like to uh, also tell the, the audience for those uh, co coming in late uh, that we um, uh, the conference is the sixth annual end of Vassal Conference for Africa and Rural America. And some of our sponsors uh, for this um, primary sponsor host institution is Raleigh General Hospital here in Bakeland, West Virginia. CEO, Mr. David Bunch, and his administrative team. We also would like to give uh, credence to uh, the International Society of Invas Specialists, uh, the Edward B. Dietrich Vassal Society, uh, and uh, others, uh, the Zuma Foundation, which uh, is uh, uh, doing great work in Africa, trying to improve healthcare disparities. We also have the um, Oya Global Medical Foundation. We have the we, we have uh, the Bialsa Special Hospital. Uh, as you've seen, Doctor Defa uh, did a few cases at the, at the hospital there. It's a consultant there, and uh, we have uh, the Silver Cross Hospital in uh, Abuja, as well as um, uh, the Save a Life Hospital, Mission, Save a Life Mission Hospital in Port Harcourt, and uh, the Nebraska Hospital in um, Lagos. Um, uh, Dr. Michael Sanusi is my collaborating associate in Nigeria when I'm in Lagos. Uh, we're grateful that he's able to join us too. And uh, we also always appreciate his help in make, taking care of all these patients. So let's take a few break and I uh, will uh, reassess in 15 minutes, yes? 12, 20, 12 minutes, okay? 1225. 12, yeah. yeah, okay, thank you so much. Don't go too far.
audio, I cannot hear what's happening here. We are on break for 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, sir.
We'll get back to the presentations in a few minutes. All right. Okay, we're back now. Um, after the short break, we'll be uh, continuing our discussions here. Our next topic will be the evolving future of endovascular surgery in Africa and rural America. And I'll be talking on this uh, very important topic. And this is a topic that essentially um, essentially looks at the essence of our conference, which is the Endovascular Conference for Africa and Rural America. And um, we'll try to make this as uh, brief as we can. Uh, so again, I'd like to give um, particular thanks to Raleigh General Hospital for uh, the host this year, and also the last year's host, uh, Duchess, Hospital in Lagos, Nigeria. And we look forward to a, um, a seventh conference next year, location undetermined, hospital undetermined. Um, yeah, we're taking bids though. The um, evolving role of endovascular surgery in Africa and rural, rural America. Endovascular surgery is as well as well, we all know as minimal invasive intervention option for treatment of simple and complex uh, vascular conditions. This uh, technology has evolved rapidly over the past 35 to 40 years. And uh, the technology has gone such as a fast pace in the United States, Europe, um, Asia, and some emerging um, countries in South America. But for, for, to a large extent, there is um, very little presence um, in Africa in terms of uh, the endovascular technology. The initial resistance to endovascular intervention by traditionally trained vascular surgeons many years ago has waned as uh, they have become late adapters to the technology. And uh, as we see many residencies and uh, many fellowships and fellowships are now uh, uh, teaching and training resident fellows in the vascular technologies. In 1971, Dr. Edward B. T. my trainer, our trainer, our mentor, uh, who passed away in, 19, uh, in 2017, uh, started the Arizona Heart Institute and Foundation. He was a pioneer um, of endovascular surgery, embraced it wholeheartedly uh, as a cardiovascular surgeon trained by Dr. DeBakey at the uh, Texas Heart, uh, at, at Baylor Medical Center in, in, in Texas. Uh, Dr. Dietrich was very astute and was a techn technically gifted surgeon and had very quick hands in endovascular technology. He started the International Society of Endovascular Specialists, initially ISES, now ISEVS. Initially it was ISE, ISES, which is International Society of, of Endovascular Surgeons. But now, as forward thinking as Dr. Dietrich was, that was expanded to, be, uh, to a cardiologist, radiologist, and others. So it became the ISEVS specialist. They also started the Journal of Endovascular Therapy as well as Transitional Research Center at the Arizona Heart Institute, where we had the privilege to work with Dr. Dietrich. Uh, the uh, ICON conference, which was uh, the mainstay of uh, 
a fellowship trainer at Arizona Heart Institute in those days, uh, was also this brainchild where live cases were performed and uh, robust uh, discussions were held. And uh, it has always uh, been a pleasure uh, to uh, be part of that situation. And we could see many programs now emulating what Dr. Dietrich did in the, in the past. For many fellows who, who trained under Dr. Dietrich um, at Arizona Heart, we're grateful for the experience we had. He was such a renowned uh, person uh, and uh, also started the International Traveling Endovascular Fellowship Program that trained many physicians from around the world, including in Africa. Following his uh, death in 2017 at age 81, the pioneering vision of endovascular surgery laid forward by Dr. Dietrich lives on today through the ISEDS, the Journal of Endovascular Therapy, and the Edward B. Dietrich Vascular Surgical Society, which uh, is uh, one of the uh, co-sponsors of this conference. We are his former fellows, we as his former fellows, have the responsibility to keep his global vision of making endovascular surgery feasible and accessible uh, worldwide. While endovascular surgery can be readily accessed in many developed countries and emerging countries, like I mentioned, um, it's very difficult, like you could see from the pre last presenter, Dr. Dr. Edafe, the difficulties, uh, the problems or challenges of endovascular surgery uh, in Africa and more so in rural American uh, communities also, we've lagged behind. This is my path to uh, where I am today. Uh, after finishing my medical school training in, in Texas, University of North Texas, moved on to internship residency training in New York and, uh, and in general surgery and moved on to vascular training with Dr. Dietrich in Arizona, uh, took a private position in Clarksburg, West Virginia uh, for five, for seven years, then moved out over to Beckley since um, 2005. So I started in 1997. And over the years in Beck, in Clarksburg, we started um, an, an endovascular program at the hospital, uh, United Hospital Center, that's doing quite well this time. And uh, then moved on to Beckley and uh, started uh, the pro two programs in Beckley, and uh, one in Lewisburg and one in um, at Bluefield. And those programs uh, in Beckley have done quite well also. And as a, as a challenge, we moved on to Bialsa Special Hospital, like you then mentioned in Dr. Defe's presentation, uh, to uh, take off the mantle of helping improve healthcare in that part of the world. Bialsa is in the southern part of Nigeria, in the oil-rich uh, part of the country, but uh, does not see the uh, oil wealth um, in terms of uh, its resources, in terms of improvement its resources. Um, but over the years, we've been trying to uh, help improve endovascular care in Bialsa, and patients are getting the benefit of that. Since 2013, we've had a mainstay in Bialsa, and 2017, when the hospital became formally commissioned as a specialist hospital, uh, we have uh, state-of-the-art cath lab and uh, and of endovascular serum that um, we use to uh, affect endovascular care. I, I call myself now a freelance global endovascular surgeon because I go wherever needs are, uh, whenever persons like Dr. Adafe and others call and they need help, we try to see what we can do to help so patients don't lose their limbs. We do know limb loss is a big problem in Africa. Uh, and uh, like stated by um, one of the speakers earlier, the population in Nigeria this time is about 200 million. And uh, uh, patients uh, do not seek help early. They come in the late stage of their, of their problems uh, because they seek uh, traditional means for treatment uh, prior to seeking um, conventional methods. And sometimes we're able to help, sometimes we're not able to help. So the goal is to educate the public the goal of this conference to educate the public and also healthcare professionals on the value 
of endovascular surgery and endovascular intervention options that can be helpful to, to the patients. Endovascular surgery alone cannot solve the problem. Sometimes open surgery is necessary. Uh, however, uh, we sometimes can have a hybrid where we can do partial open, partial endovascular surgery to solve the problem, as you will see from the, um, some of the um, presentations later. What is the future of endovascular surgery? The evolving future of endovascular surgery in medical disadvantaged communities remain a major challenge. The cardiovascular and vascular disease profile in Africa and rural America are quite similar. Patients present with end-stage disease due to lack of uh, adequate resources, mostly financial, as well as awareness, especially when these patients seek non-traditional means for their, for their health care. We do know that the cost of intervention can be exorbitant for the average African whose yearly per, ca per capita income may be as low as $360 US dollars or less. Supplementary governmental assistance uh, such as Medicare or Medicaid are non-existent for many in Africa while they may be available in rural America. So that's a fundamental difference between having an ischemic leg in an African country and having an ischemic leg in rural America. In rural America, you can still be flown to the big city and um, get your problem solved. Or if you have specialists in your rural area, they can solve your problem too. But in Africa, we don't have the luxury of that. So that is a problem. The cost of setting up an endovascular center in a hospital is um, daunting. It's not feasible in the African context because uh, it's quite expensive. Uh, even in the US, large urban communities are having difficulties uh, staying afloat financially uh, because of the expenses associated with endovascular therapy for both cardiac and vascular cases. What are the challenges that, challenges we face in endovascular care in Africa? Um, the availability of ready power supply is a big problem. Um, you can't run a cath lab machinery or or machinery if your power is not guaranteed because you don't want to have a problem while you're doing surgery and the light goes off. And countries do have that problem now, so it's the problem. Uh, corrupt governmental practices do not help, and lack of adequate trained endovascular specialists in some countries also is a major problem. And for some countries who have trained surgeons, they just don't have the consumables or the equipment to work with, the balloons, the stents, the arthrectomy devices, the percutaneous uh, devices that we typically use. How can we change the narrative? We have to create regional centers of endovascular excellence, in my humble opinion, because I've, I go there routinely and I've seen some of the challenges up front and some of the surgeons and interventions there are quite savvy because they do a whole lot more with less. And we in America tend to do, uh, tend to be a little more wasteful and uh, they are really careful in not being wasteful. So that's one. Of, that's a big problem, a big uh, difference or problem that we need to change the narrative. Uh, one way to do that, uh, as we all know, if you go to a hospital setting in Africa, you may be left in a hospital inpatient care for an extended period of time. And that's expensive for some persons who really originally don't have any money to pay for it. And you keep them in the hospital for so long a period of time, then that becomes problematic. So uh, one way to go around that would be to consider outpatient or office-based lab con concept or model. That will certainly take care of the patient same day, minutes to hours, and they leave and go home for, for further management and follow up as an outpatient. That's one way to drive the cost down. The cost of intervention also can be significantly reduced if we use this model. We need to continue our outpatient educational campaign, such as the one we're having now, 
uh, through education conferences, practical training and experiences, and um, awareness, uh, patient awareness for both patients as well as the uh, uh, healthcare providers at all levels, physicians, nurses, technologists, um, physical therapists, and, all, and others. So they will be able to identify when a patient has a problem that requires intervention so that, that will minimize the delays. The use of social media is a great tool because we know even in Africa, most uh, persons have a cell phone. So they're able to access social media very easily and quickly. So TV and radio newspaper campaign also can be useful. What I see based on what I've seen uh, going to Africa all this many times uh, over these years is that the natural resources lie in Africa. The resources that we use for our cell phones, for um, materials we use for our equipment are there. Uh, we, uh, companies from, from, from US and uh, Europe go there, take the resources, come back, build something, but it's really hard for them to give back uh, quickly. They will tell you our uh, project does not include Africa at this time. And that's what they say. So that being said, the African countries and uh, uh, universities must create research and development programs in the biomedical departments of the universities and vocational schools where raw materials can readily be available in a, that are readily available in Africa can be developed to uh, advance and enhance the our end vascular toolbox in those areas. So that is the key. So they're not totally dependent on foreign aid. So I would say endovascular technology has been real and has been quite helpful in providing care for persons in urban centers, in rural settings, and uh, medical disadvantaged uh, settings. It can be also helpful, but not all endovascular surgeons prefer to come to rural environments. Therefore, we have to seek ways to bridge the gap. One way is through telemedicine. Uh, telemedicine options can be utilized to improve care, just like we use telestroke medicines, uh, telenephrology services. We need to look into televascular uh, options. And we're doing that also currently uh, with uh, the African countries, um, especially in Nigeria at this time, where we're able to uh, provide endovascular consultations and uh, treatment solutions uh, through uh, with, with a reliable uh, uh, specialist on the other side of the pond. So I submit that the future of endovascular surgery remains clouded, especially for Africa and some rural communities in Africa. The unveiling of the cloud will depend on meaningful collaboration with reliable international endovascular specialists enhanced local educational training by virtual and in-person platforms and reversal of medical tourism, which depletes the uh, resources, financial resources, resources of these countries because pat uh, patients or persons who seek help leave the countries to Europe, to Middle East, to uh, United States for the healthcare solutions. So by reversing medical tourism, by improving the endovascular options for these patients, we might, we might, we might be able to keep some of that financial um, monies that leave the country. We're talking to the tune of uh, millions of dollars. Better governmental contributions in terms of sub subsidy may help and improve local biomedical research and development in universities and vocational schools will also be helpful in advancing the endovascular technologies in medical in in rural America as well as Africa. That being said, any questions? Thank you for your attention. Any questions here or on the platform? No, boy, you're doing good job, man. Well, thank you, Dr. Singh. Keep editing, okay? Thank you. Good karma. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Oye. Um, a question. A question, sure. I don't have a question, Dr. Goji. 
Can you hear oh, me? Yes, uncle, can you hear Dr. Gorgi? How are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. I, I don't have a question. I, I, I want to thank you, Dr. Oye, for your perseverance in this advocacy. I've had you speak and cry about Africa, this part of our world. I I I I I just want to say thank you very much. I I I truly believe your proposals are the way to go, especially the need for government, our tertiary institutions to take the bull by the horn to develop our own resources, techniques, and um, technology that should uh, solve our problems in peculiar ways. Keep the good job. And God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Gorgi. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We look forward to your talk. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm ready. I'm ready for okay. this end. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, is Dr. Dapa here? Um, okay. In, in that... Yes, I'm around. No, Doctor, we're looking for Doc. Uh, we're looking for Dr. Dapa. That, that's our next speaker. Don't leave Dr. Dapa. I need you soon, okay? Um, okay, if Dr. Dapa isn't here, we'll move on to our next speaker, Dr. Melissa Oye. Are you here, Doctor? Yes, I am here. Thank you. So I will stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. Oh, you know what? Give me one. No, uh, I've done my. <laughs> yeah, Dr. 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 we got you. The next speaker is Dr. Melissa Oye. Uh, Dr. Melissa Oye is a local product of uh, uh, West Virginia. She attended. Uh, Woodrow Wilson um, High School here and um, went to college at Westland uh, in uh, West Virginia and proceeded to the uh, West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, and following that, she did her um, residency at the University of Florida in internal medicine. And she's currently um, a fellow in oncology and hematology at uh, Emory University in Atlanta. Dr. Oye. Hey everyone, thank you guys for allowing me to do this presentation. Give me just a minute to connect my slides. Let me know if you require any help. I think I that think I, I may have to email, email you my slides email. and you can pull it up. All right. Do you have a Gmail? Gmail? Yes, I will text it to you right now. So we'll just take a one minute bit, uh, break until we get Miss yeah. uh, Dr. Oye's yeah, Dr. slides up. Slides up.
All right, Dr. Melissa Oye, I got it. I am now just going to share your screen. Thank you for emailing it. All right. Okay, great. Okay, great. You have a little echo. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know. How about now? Oh, that's perfect. Oh, that's okay, Thank great. You. Are you able to put it in um, presentation mode? Yes. yes. Is that fine? Yeah, that's good. Um, so, hey everyone, my name is Melissa Oye. I am a hematology oncology fellow at Emory University. I'm very delighted to give you this talk about where we stand in sickle cell disease treatment. Thank you to, to the original Dr. Oye, my dad, for hosting this conference where we can join together to expand our topics that are relevant globally. So in the next slide, I'll quickly review sickle cell disease. It's a genetic disorder inherited in an autosomal recessive manner. The hallmark mutation of sickle cell disease affects the sixth amino acid in the hemoglobin beta chain. It replaces the normal glutamate amino acid with valine. This point mutation results in hemoglobin polymerization in a hypoxic environment, leading to the deformation of red blood cells and inclusion of the microvasculature. Next slide, sickle cell disease. It's a systemic condition. It's characterized by cycles of microvascular vaso occlusion leading to end organ ischemia injury and infarction. Acute painful episodes, persistent anemia, and a markedly shorter average lifetime. So from the diagram, we can see that sickle cell truly affects every organ from head to toe, inside out. We talked about skin ulcers earlier in wounds. Sickle cell disease is a huge contributor to this as well. Really, this condition can cause catastrophic and fatal complications. The next slide is a map of the United States and sickle cell disease prevalence. The more the intense colors is a higher prevalence of sickle cell disease within the state, we can see a high prevalence in the Southeast area. Some standout states are Florida, New York, um, Texas has a very high prevalence, California. It's estimated that sickle cell disease affects approximately 100,000 Americans. So in the U.S., a disease that affects less than 200,000 people is considered a rare disease. So sickle cell disease technically within the United States is considered rare. However, it is very well known. It's something that we learn throughout medical school. If you're in a population that has a larger African-American population, you will be treating patients with sickle cell because the clinical implications are so outstanding. 90% of persons with sickle cell disease in the United States are African-American. Um, it occurs out of one in every 365 Black or African-American births. Next slide. Although sickle cell disease only affects 100,000 Americans out of total population of 331 million, the healthcare costs for this population are about $3 billion per year per person. So without a doubt, sickle cell disease is a major contributor to healthcare cost within the United States. Um, give me one second. This um, next slide, we are going to look at the worldwide prevalence of sickle cell disease. And from the best estimates, it is approximately 25 million. The next slide is a map looking at the birth incidence of sickle cell disease in 2021. Again, the more intense the color, the higher incidence. So we see the highest sickle cell burden concentrated in Western and Central Sub-Saharan Africa and also India. There are six countries that make almost make up almost 50% of the global incidence of sickle cell. That's Equatorial Guinea, Benin, Burkina Faso, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Togo. Around 1,000 babies are born every day 
in Africa with sickle cell disease. Now looking at the same map, but sickle cell disease mortality, 2021, the highest mortality burden, again, concentrated sub-Saharan Africa, where this study indicated approximately 30,000 people died from sickle cell disease. And given the underdiagnosis of sickle cell disease, this is probably an underestimation. So treatment, current basis of treatment can be divided into two categories. The first category is gonna be supportive or disease modifying. The second category being curative. The supportive category includes blood transfusions, so disease modifying medications, that's hydroxyurea and pain medications because we know painful crises are one of the most common reasons that sickle cell patients present to the hospital. The curative category includes bone marrow transplant, and we have a new kit on the block, and that is gene therapy that has shown pretty promising results that I'll talk about a little bit later. So starting with hydroxyurea, it's a chemotherapeutic agent. It's been FDA approved for treatment of sickle cell since 1998. Hydroxyurea is gold standard therapy for sickle cell disease treatment in both children and adults. It reduces the frequency of pain crises, and it is the only medication that confers a mortality benefit in sickle cell disease. So quite frankly, hydroxyurea helps patients with sickle cell disease reach adulthood. It works by increasing hemoglobin F production. Hemoglobin F or fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen, and it's less susceptible to red blood cell sickling. Fetal hemoglobin typically persists until about age of six months, and that's why newborn babies who have sickle cell disease are normally asymptomatic until the six-month mark when the switch from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin occurs. Hydroxyurea side effects is myelosuppression is a big one, and that requires lab monitoring that's not always feasible in lower-income countries fertility concerns, and it is a presumed carcinogen, which implies that there is a carcinogenic risk to humans with long-term use. This next slide, due to hydroxyurea's myelosuppressive effect, there is a concern for increased infection. So this study called the No Harm Study was evaluating the impact of hydroxyurea on the development of malaria. No Harm stands for the novel use of hydroxyurea in an African region with malaria. It was a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial conducted in Uganda, and it was comparing hydroxyurea to placebo for 12 months. The primary outcome was incidence of clinical malaria. Secondary outcomes included sickle cell anemia-related adverse events and clinical and laboratory effects. The results showed the malaria incidence did not differ between children on hydroxyurea versus placebo. And a composite sickle cell anemia-related clinical outcome that was looking at vaso-occlusive painful crises, dactylitis, acute chest syndrome, the requirement of blood transfusion was less frequent in the hydroxyurea group, 45%, than compared to the placebo group at 69%. Therefore, the conclusion is that hydroxyurea appears safe for children with sickle cell anemia living in malaria-endemic sub-Saharan Africa without an increased risk of malaria or adverse effects. From 1998 until 2017, the only approved pharmacological sickle cell disease treatment was hydroxyurea, despite the disease's high frequency and low survival rates. Since 2017, three new agents have gained FDA approval for sickle cell disease, but of note, these medications do not confer a mortality benefit like hydroxyurea does. So although we have had some advancement, these medications still aren't the end-all, be-all for treatment of sickle cell disease. Starting with the most recently approved agent, which is L-glutamine, that gained FDA approval in 2017 for sickle cell disease in adults and pediatric patients five years or older. L-glutamine is an essential amino acid, meaning that it cannot be synthesized from scratch and it must come from dietary sources. 
the mechanism of action of how L-glutamine treats sickle cell disease is not fully understood. It's believed that it helps sickle red blood cells to tolerate increased oxidative stress. In clinical trials, it's been shown to decrease pain crises and hospitalizations. However, it was not shown to increase hemoglobin levels. It comes in a packet form that's added to food or water. The next medication, Oxbrida, gained FDA approval in 2019 for treatment of sickle cell in patients 12 years or older. It's a hemoglobin S polymerization inhibitor, leading to less red blood cell sickling and destruction, which reduces hemolysis and vaso-occlusive events. In clinical trials, it was shown to increase hemoglobin levels, and this is an expensive medication costing about $100,000 to $250,000 per year. Next medication, crizoluzumab, FDA approved 2019 for prevention of recurrent pain crises in sickle cell disease patients age 16 and older. It's a monoclonal antibody that is administered once monthly by IV. This is important. Notably, two months ago, the European Commission revoked the conditional marketing authorization for crizoluzumab in the European Union based off results of a phase three study that failed to show a statistically significant difference between crizoluzumab and placebo in rates of pain crises. The fate of this drug in the United States is to be determined. However, it does not look like a promising long-term sickle cell disease treatment. At this time, stem cell transplant is the only established curative intervention. The first sickle cell transplant for sickle cell disease was done in 1984 in a pediatric patient who had sickle cell disease and acute myelogenous leukemia or AML. The transplant cured both diseases. So what's a transplant process? Brief, briefly, replacing it replaces the abnormal stem cells with healthy donor cells. This process requires chemotherapy to destroy the existing stem cells. Who should be considered for a stem cell transplant? Ideally, the patient should be younger than 16, have an HLA identical related donor, and have evidence of end organ damage as manifested by any of the following. Neurological symptoms, so a history of stroke, for example, if they have frequent pain crises, recurrent acute chest syndrome, sickle cell nephropathy or sickle cell retinopathy. So really that's going to encompass most patients who have the most severe form of sickle cell disease, which is the homozygous hemoglobin SS. So if many people may be eligible for transplant based off their clinical symptoms, why are transplant rates so low for patients with sickle cell disease? There's a few reasons for this. One being that Within the U.S., less than 20% of patients have a matched sibling donor, meaning most patients who may want to pursue transplant will not have a donor to do so. Another one being that due to the end organ damage inquired by sickle cell disease, some patients will not be eligible for transplant because they will not be able to tolerate the intensive chemotherapy that goes along with the transplant process. As of 2021, stem cell transplant was only available in six centers in all of Africa. The U.S. had 215 centers that offered transplant. So what are the potential harms of stem cell transplant that have to be considered in those who may be a candidate and interested in this intervention? The first and foremost is going to be death. Overall, kids have superior survival rates than compared to adults. In a large retrospective analysis of transplant in patients with sickle cell disease, mortality occurred in 5 to 20% of patients. For patients younger than 16, the overall survival rate is 95%. And for patients older than 16, the overall survival rate drops to 81%. Some other potential harms are graft versus host disease, which is a systemic disorder when the graft's immune cells recognize the host as foreign and begins to attack the host. For kids really less than 16, the incidence of acute graft versus host disease is 12%. For those older than 16, that risk increased up to 16%. And then there's also possibility for chronic graft versus host disease, which is a myriad of different symptoms that can affect quality of life. Graft failure is 
another concern because if you're going through this process, you get the chemotherapy, you have the anticipation and hope that your sickle cell disease may be cured and the graft fails. That occurs in about five to 10% of patients and that's based off different factors. And other infections is common. Typically they are able to be treated. Sometimes they may be fatal. Infertility due to the chemotherapy that is required for the transplant process must be considered. We do now have better access to gamete preservation. So egg and sperm preservation prior to receiving chemotherapy. It's expensive. It's not always required um, insured and sometimes it's not always accessible. Gene therapy. So this is really a new kid on the block and there's still a lot of unknowns about gene therapy and who may be eligible for this in the future. Right now it's still in the clinical phase and there's different types of gene therapy. There is gene editing, there's gene silencing, there's gene addition, but they all follow the same basic procedure is where the stem cells are gonna be extracted from the patient, from the patient's bone marrow. They're gonna go undergo whatever gene editing process that is going to be performed. They're going to receive chemotherapy to make room for the new altered cells that are going to be injected back into them. So it's a pretty exciting time. Um, gene therapy has been used in some other genetic disorders and has had promising results. We The first gene therapy was done in 2015 for sickle cell disease. So we are still waiting to see where this may lead in the future, but it really is a historical breakthrough in the treatment of sickle cell disease. But on the next slide, we can see that there's still a lot of unknown questions about gene therapy. We still need a lot of longitudinal studies to determine the durability of gene therapy. Is this truly a curative therapy or is this something that may relapse in 10, 15 years? We don't know yet that because we don't have the long-term data. We'll still have to see the complications of the gene therapy. We still have to receive chemotherapy with gene therapy. So that means that there's a risk of infertility. There's risk of chemotherapy complications. There's risk of secondary malignancy. So a lot of unknowns. And one good question that some people may have is how many stem cells must be altered for gene therapy to be effective? We don't know that answer yet. And then cost, of course, is something on everyone's mind, how accessible will gene therapy be to the average person with sickle cell disease in middle to high income countries? Very likely not accessible. The estimates right now are $2 million per patient. So if we're thinking about countries who have low resources, it may be decades and decades until this may be an, a feasible option. So again, you know, my, my dad had talked about bridging the gap in vascular and endovascular care. How can we bridge the gap in sickle cell disease? Because we are seeing that people within the United States who have sickle cell disease are living longer, right? With the newborn screening, with prophylactic antibiotics, with penicillin until age five, with the invent of vaccines like the pneumococcal vaccine in 2000, which significantly reduced the infant mortality in sickle cell disease with the hydroxyurea use, someone with sickle cell disease still has 20 to 30 years lower life expectancy in the United States than someone who does not have sickle cell disease, but patients with sickle cell disease are now living into adulthood, which we didn't see years and years ago, but we still see a huge difference between a patient in the US or other high income country than compared to lower income countries. So how can we bridge that gap? There's a few different ways that we need to do that, but here are some that I'll mention today. Newborn screening and early diagnosis is going to be a big one. So the American Society of Hematology established the newborn screening in Africa with seven countries, and that's Ghana, Kenya, Liberia, Nigeria, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zambia. The goal of this program is to expand early access to diagnostic screening for sickle cell, to model the cost of universal early diagnosis, diagnosis that can be applied to other sub-Saharan African countries, and to evaluate the effectiveness of early diagnosis and clinical interventions in reducing childhood mortality. 
we have to improve access to hydroxyurea. This is the gold standard treatment for sickle cell disease. We know it works. We know it helps patients to live into an adulthood. But yet we still see a lot of countries do not have widespread access to hydroxyurea. So before we can think about gene therapy or even kind of widespread stem cell transplant, we have to think about the most basic medication with hydroxyurea. It's an oral medication that everyone should have access to. It is still not on the local essential medicine list in many African countries. And that's going to be crucial first step in facilitating a national import plan. Ghana has made some really good steps in 2019. Their government committed to ensure access, free access to hydroxyurea for all patients with sickle cell disease. So hopefully their, their model of doing so may help other African countries follow along to ensure everyone with sickle cell disease has access to hydroxyurea research is needed. So we see most of the research for sickle cell disease coming out of the United States, where there's about 110,000 persons with sickle cell disease, as compared to Africa, where there are millions and millions of people with sickle cell disease. So we need research to be done in the countries that are most affected by sickle cell disease. Out of the 23 African countries with the highest burden of sickle cell disease, only six countries, which were Benin, Burkina Faso, Liberia, Mali, Togo, and Zambia, had funding allocated in their natural national budget for research related to sickle cell disease. And one other thing that I'll mention that you know can help bridge the gap, routine vaccine can help prevent life-threatening infections and increase the, the possibility that newborns and toddlers with sickle cell disease are, are making it past that five, five year mark. So thank you so much for, for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed this talk and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Melissa, nice job. Uh, thank you so much. It's ironic that the population of Africa is 1.7 billion and the population of the United States is only 300 million. And we still have only six centers in Africa and 215 centers in the, in the US. So yeah. that, that tells us that the African countries are not doing enough to, um, to help stem the problem that uh, is real in, um, in Africa. I do know that on a on a, on some personal level, the people take initiative when they want to get married. Want to make sure you know that sickle cell SS <laughs> they do that. But you know, but uh, it, it's a real problem. The cost is phenomenally high, uh, based on your presentation. Uh, the more uh, expensive uh, treatment options, that short of um, the medical therapy with um, hydroxyurea, the cost is fairly expensive. Uh, the uh, transplant and and uh, uh, gene potential gene therapy sound very expensive, so I, I guess a lot of research has to be done. Any more questions for Dr. Oye before we move on? Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, okay. Nice. Uh, I have Oye, a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Melissa, for the presentation. Quite very um, exhaustive and um, current. Um, I'm. I'm really. Uh, I've learned a lot. I'm happy to hear, I mean, I'm hearing for the first time about L-glutamine -glutam, and the, mm -hmm. the other one, ox, ox brit, brittle. So it's nice to hear that some, some other uh, uh, amoria coming into the play. Hydroxyurea, I see it, I prescribe it commonly here yeah, for a good number of the C class or sickle cell patients have, 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 have um, managed. Uh, yes, it's useful really, it's useful really. But I always keep at the back of my mind as I follow them through with full blood count, plated plant, just to see. I, I don't see, I mean, after many years, I have um, a 10 year, 10 years old girl. I have uh, one that is 23. They've been on Nigeria for some time. And, and, and the feared myelosuppression. I've never, I, I, I've not had any colleague talk about it. Uh, is it common with you guys? I know it's very available in there. You do, you you use it a lot for many years. You've been doing that. You have great access. 
How common is it, myelosuppression? Which is one of the reasons why some don't want to even start. Yeah, absolutely. So it is it is fairly common, and that's why with any dose adjustment, it's recommended that laboratory monitoring of the, the WBC, the hemoglobin and the platelets be done. And that's why in some countries they feel like hydroxyurea use not be as feasible because they don't have access to labs that can monitor so frequently as may need to be done with, with dose adjustments. We typically see with stable dosing that the myelosuppression effect seems to be a little bit less. It's when we're trying to reach those maximum tolerated doses of hydroxyurea. So we have the most benefit in terms of clinical improvement where we may start to compromise with some of the myelosuppression. So it can be seen, um, it should be something that should be monitored, but if we're looking at risk versus benefits and it's improving the, the frequency of pain crises, reducing hospitalization and improving mortality, we may be able to accept some of the myelosuppressive effects knowing that overall, this will have a greater benefit if they're on this medication at the maximum tolerated doses. Okay, thank you, thank you. Just one quick one. Uh, recently, a, a sick love died in, the, in, 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 in a plane on the way while flying. Mm. I, I want to, I want to, oh, yeah, died and she's, she's an adult sickler, 42. Um, uh, I, 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 be, I want to believe that the pressurized compartment, we said she had a crisis in the plane and was rushed and then didn't make it. The pressurized compartment in the plane, is it, is it, is it established, is it known to increase um, sickling? Is it known to be a risk factor? No, that is an excellent question that I have not encountered, and I would have to do a little bit more research on that. I would like to say yes, because we know that very small changes in the environment of patients with sickle cell disease, even going out to very cold weather, can and induce a, a sickle cell vasoocclusive event. So I'm yes. sure with the high cabin pressure and the change in the, in the air pressure, that that absolutely could also induce a sickle cell pain crisis. So I would have to look that a little further and see kind of what we know about patients who have sickle cell disease, if they're at their, their best state, for example, they're taking their hydroxyurea, they're not in a pain crisis, what is the likelihood that going on a plane may induce a pain crisis? So I can look into that and get back to you, but that is a, a very great question because just because you have sickle cell disease, that doesn't mean that you never want to get on a plane and go somewhere, right? So you would have to know your risk of doing so. And I think that yeah, exactly. we should exactly. educate patients on as well. So I will have to educate myself on that a little bit more, but I, would, I can get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have nice one question sir. from Dr. Michelle Oye, just asking if all sickle cell disease patients should be on folic acid. Yes, all sickle cell disease patients should be on folic acid. We know that they have higher rates of hemolysis and they need folic acid to support the production of red blood cells. So yes, all patients should be on folic acid um, when they're not in pain crises, when, they're, when they are on pain crises, they should be on folic acid. And something else that I didn't mention in my presentation, but pain medication is an extremely important part of treatment for sickle cell disease. There is a lot of discrimination against patients who have sickle cell disease. There's a lot of misinformation, judgment. Someone who has sickle cell disease, they've likely been the most severe form hemoglobin SFs. They've been in the hospital since they've been very young, one years old. They will be reliant on pain medications and we should never deny pain medications to someone who is coming to us for help in a pain crisis. Mel, uh, Dr. Melissa, oh yeah, that's one more final question for my part. Um, um, or not, maybe a comment. I see a fair amount of uh, sickle cell patients in Africa with wounds. And one of the things that we've done uh, to help um, make their wounds heal fast, faster is use of topical oxygen, uh, topical hyperic oxygen. Um, do you have any information on that? I, I do not have any information on hyperbaric oxygen for, for wound healing. I am sure that if it's been established as a, a fairly 
reliable wound treatment in, in other cases of venous and arterial ulcers, that it would be also applicable to the sickle cell wounds as well. But I don't have any established data on the use of hyperbaric oxygen treatment in wounds related to sickle cell disease. Thank you, doctor. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Shadi Abu Alimars, um, as an endovascular vascular surgeon who practices in, in Charleston, West Virginia at CAMC. He's an uh, assistant professor of surgery. He does great endovascular work and, and aneurysm, and aneurysm care and vascular disease care. Dr. Shadi has been gracious always to uh, help us with our conferences, and we appreciate this opportunity again uh, for, for him to help us out with this year's conference uh, and look forward to his talk. Dr. Shadi, welcome and thank you. Dr. Oye, thank you so much for uh, the introduction, and I really appreciate uh, giving me this chance to um, talk about our experience here and something a little bit different I decided to change. I'm going to share my screen. Um, again, my name is Shadi. I'm uh, one of the vascular surgeons here with the, let me see if you can see it or not. Okay. Can you see me guys? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. So this is a, a topic that, uh, we do a lot of dialysis. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of dialysis access and it came to my mind where Talk about rural spaces and Africa. Uh, I came from a country that we always try to um, talk about dialysis access for patients and how they get permacast. It's funny, actually. Um, we're not being political, but in the in the war zone now, I talk to some of my friends that actually work in that area, and they have a pretty high prevalence of fistulas and graft creation because. They just don't have access to gra to uh, dialysis catheters, so it's kind of weird that when Kaduki say dial fistula first, they uh, it happens actually in underdeveloped areas because they just don't have access all the time to catheters, which is easy for us just pop in and out. So a lot of patients here in the United States are dependent on catheters for dialysis, dependent on catheters for TPN for long term access. And that's what we end up with, people that has no good access. So we'll start with this talk. I have no disclosure background of this, this case. And we're going to talk about what, what in general, this central venous occlusion thing. So 66-year-old uh, female patient that was uh, um, had a history of really complicated general surgery history. She had colectomies, uh, multiple hernia repairs, end up with intercutaneous fistulas. She has been in and out of the hospital for probably two, three years with um, on chemotherapy for the cancer that she has for colectomy. She had this fistula. She was MPO for a long time, malnourished, TPN. She had a lot of central catheters, infuser ports, Heckman catheters, whatever you name it, all these central axes. They use her internal jugular vein, use subclavian vein. They use actually her femoral veins, multiple, multiple. And every time she comes back with infections, DVTs, she put an anticoagulation, off anticoagulation. Uh, with, over time, she started to develop a kidney injury that to the limit that she actually needed dialysis. So she was having um, an attack that she needs a dialysis access. She didn't really harvest all her dialysis access points at this time. This is a picture of what we call uh, the, what we talk about, what's, what's really central venous exclusion. You can see in the picture, this is her chest area. This is the right side of the chest. This is a peripheral venogram, and there's almost you don't see anything. This is her venous uh, return from the right arm. This is her central venous occlusion system. That's the innominate area or the right in, uh, brachycephalic vein. And this is just a lot of significant lateralization. The SVC was collapsed, but it was open at one point, it was collapsed. So the problem in this patient is we have the prevalence of central venous occlusion in about 25% of patient dialysis or central venous access patient. It can increase to around 45%. Almost 50, half of these people will have history of central access occlusions. And in patients with history of infected central access, this risk can go up to three times. So that chance can go up 70, 80% that they have no access. 
no access at all. So in this patient, I'm going to play the image that you can see we try to actually access the IJ on the left side. I got into a small branch and you can see the collaterals going to space. There is a small area that I could see maybe some through azigas branch going into the SVC on the on the image on the left side of the screen. So I'm on the table. I need to put a catheter in this patient. Typically, we stick the catheter just above the clavicle. So um, in this patient, we can see, again, normal anatomy. There's IJ axis. Sometimes people use EJ, uh, subclavian veins, femoral veins. In this patient, really, her everything is occluded. Even her IVC has severe stenosis in this patient uh, because of the multiple catheter that she has before in the femoral vein. So we talked together. It's like maybe we should stick transhepatic. I don't personally do that. We can put an AV graft in her arm, but she ended up with a lot of swelling in her arm, but uh, we can use it within 24 hours. There's uh, more techniques coming out. We call the inside out. It depends on the availability of this, gra of this device and the cost of the device. And we decided to do something that we have been doing now for probably, we have almost like 10 patients. We call it the transport technique, come up with this fancy name. So in this patient, you can see the picture on the on the left side of the screen. We uh, This is her clavicle. This is her subclavian, so sternocleidal mastoid muscle. Uh, my finger is on top of her suprasternal notch. We access the internal jugular vein with a micropuncture needle, uh, literally just behind her earlobe. So it's pretty high access. And um, as you see, we, we marked where we want to put the catheter in the future, where you see the red dot there. I, I access put a five French sheet and we have a wire to it. And um, this is what we end up with. I end up with actually crossing the occlusion from the top. We put a stiff wire, glide catheter. We, I think we use a, a, it just crossing the venous occlusion. We cross the occlusion in this patient and um, I've had a wire into the SVC in this patient. Now, typically you can see the wasting of the balloon. This is a five by 100 balloon. You can see the wasting area, just really exactly where we typically access. And I was looking with the ultrasound. Every time I collapsed that balloon, the whole vein just collapsed. I mean, it's probably shredded. There's no vein there. It's maybe just a bunch of scar tissue. So I could not just inflate and just try to stick that there. It's, it's, there's no track. So I need to find that track to get the wire and balloon so we can access. So what we did after we did, we advanced. Um, we decided to actually put a, a non-compliant balloon, a Dorado balloon, something has a Kevlar lining. I ballooned the entire length of the SVC, the brachioencephalic, the IJ with an 8 by 40. And I think we end up with 10 by 40 balloon in a couple of times. Uh, we inflate the balloon and we access the balloon itself. So we put a wire, an 014 wire in the balloon itself, an 018, sorry, 018 wire in the balloon. And later on, I'm going to show a picture of picture. So this balloon here, it's inflated in the IJ exactly above the clavicle where we want to put the catheter in so we can tunnel it. And in this video, you can see that we're going to get a good image and you see the tip of the needle, and we're stabbing the balloon now there. Now, after we stab it, I put the wire, and it goes into the space of the balloon itself. We call it in the balloon. And after we call it, we advance the balloon into the SVC along with the wire that we already stuck in. So you can see this picture. The balloon is at the clavicle. We advance the balloon, and we advance the wire that we stuck it, the fresh wire. Now, the balloon works as, I'm going to do a video of this. You can see we advance the balloon and we push the wire too. So this wire, this balloon help us to transport that newly advanced wire. So this is the final picture. We have the wire from supraclavicular area. The balloon help us that we have from behind the ear all the way down to the SVC. And after that, we just did a regular exchange. We have this dilated already work well. So what else can be done? Some intervention radiologists reported using this, we call it Rosh Hashida needle. They can just sharp canalize the whole thing. So they actually stick a subclavian if you want, and they just advance through the occlusion. And then they, they catch a wire uh, that's going through the occlusion area. There is a reader frequency. They can be snored at. Uh, I, I never used that before, but they can burn through the occlusion and try to recanalize these veins. And they can advance that. Again, I never used that. Uh, we use that sometimes with, with transit, uh, sorry, 
um, uh, to going through the inferior vena cava to embolize uh, type 2 indolique with aneurysms, but uh, this is a technique that has been described by interventional geology friends. They can burn, we call the burn through the uh, uh, way to get into the uh, uh, a good lesion, and usually have a snare that coming from the femoral, and they put a wire through it. The new device is called the Inside Out. It's a pretty expensive device, almost $5,000, but has been developed actually here by a surgeon in West Virginia, but um, it's called Inside Out Technique. They they actually get from the femoral vein with the O35 wire. They, uh, I'll show you a video of that. Uh, they put a marker, and that Inside Out, they give you a support where you can actually stab a, a needle through the skin, and then it's a hollow needle that you can put a wire through it, and then through that, you can actually advance. So we call the surfacer now being sold there. And uh, just a final video. Now, this surfacer device, I think the cost of it is, I mean, it's a couple of thousand dollars. Uh, of course, the company had to buy that. Uh, I think it's a very nice technique. This is where the occlusion is. You put the O35 wire and um, you recanalize. You mark where the tip of that catheter is, you actually mark it exactly where you want. You can see there's actually a small hole area that we'll call a target window. And then this will give you support and you stab a wire through that hollow area that go through the skin. You grab that through the skin. It's kind of the same thing we did with the balloon, but again, it's a fancy way you put a wire and the sheet through it. So this will help you get into the central veins of these patients. Of course, What's the limitation why we don't use these devices? It just really depends on the availability of these devices, the anatomic restrictions, because you have to have femoral access typically in these patients. So some people can argue, say, well, I'll just put a femoral vein access or get catheter. In our case, we have really no femoral, no other access. So we end up come out with this new uh, technique or we call a transporter where you can stick the balloon to introduce us down the central veins. And of course, in some urgent cases where you have no device on the shelf. Thank you so much. Dr. Shardy, thank you for a nice presentation, as, as always. Uh, we still have some of those patients here in Beckley, West Virginia. I have a challenging one I might send to you in Charles <laughs> Brackett. Um, yeah, I also have a similar case like the one you just showed last uh, that I had uh, seen in um, Nigeria. And um, obviously the limitations of equipment uh, I did cross the lesion and uh, was able to, not to capture the wire from the other end. There was no, uh, uh, th there was no snare readily available. So I switched the wire from 035 to 018 and could not re-enter re re again. So I guess I have to do that again some other time. So I'm not looking forward to it. So, but yeah, I using, uh, if I just, the tips of this technique that we, we, we created here is actually using a non-compliant balloon because the regular balloons, when they rupture, because you're going to rupture the balloon, it can actually slide, it can slit the entire length of the balloon, and we're not able to push a 014 or 018 wire through it. Uh, so that these non-compliant balloons, they're more expensive, but I think they're available uh, almost everywhere, and you can get them. And you can, uh, even when you rupture the balloon, they don't rupture completely. You can actually have time to advance enough length of the wire. Uh, in, the, in the recent... Um, probably a few cases, we actually use a longer balloon. So I use eight by 80 balloon, Conquest. So I have enough length. I put the balloon just the tip, like probably three, four centimeters above the clavicle where I stick. And the rest of the balloon is going all the way into the SVC. So when I advance the wire, it's almost always already there into the SVC. And you just keep pushing the balloon, which we have the wire of the balloon into the IVC uh, or the hepatic area. So it comes off the wire easy. I mean, I hope I can explain that more, but Maybe. Yeah, but if you have the, um, I, I used the, um, the non-compliant balloons such as Dorado Conquest, yes. Now, if if I'm able to cross the lesion, uh, in your case here, with 035 wire, and uh, even it's a complete occlusion, then next step could be uh, maybe using a more stiffer wire, and that way you don't have to do a second stick, don't you think? No, the problem is, Dr. Oye, I'm going to go back to the presentation. So one of the problems with the, like when we stick up here, I'm going to just go to the first picture, and which I see it a lot. This uh, putting the catheters up high in the neck or behind the ear, they just tend to kink and malfunction. They just don't work for a long time. 
So typically, this, the the axis should be around the clavicle area. Correct. That's, that's the problem. So if you stick, if you use your own stick above the, at the ear level, it's gonna kink and it's gonna migrate the the catheter. A lot of the time, they just come backwards when the patient lay down. So they end up like thrombosing, sitting in the in the brachiocephalic or even almost to the IG, which I saw a lot. So tr we try not to leave the catheter tunneled all the way up, up really high behind the earlobe. So we try to get it as low as possible behind the clavicle. Right. Now, what's the role of um, intravascular lithotripsy if you're able to cross a completely occluded um, vessel in your case here? Uh, would you consider that uh, to... Uh, I, don't, I mean, I didn't try it, but I don't think it's going to do anything with the scar tissue because it's really a waveform that will help to... It's. A, I don't think it's a really actually great balloons for complete angioplasty. They're good for calcified lesion for sure, but uh, but uh, not for uh, sclerotic. This is mainly a sclerotic lesion. And that's one of the problem when you inflate the balloon and you deflate it, the whole vein just collapsed completely. It doesn't maintain. That's why iliac veins, you cannot just angioplasty them. You have to put a stent in them to keep them open. So the same thing problem here. I mean, it thought about sticking a stent in the IJ, but I'm like, I'm going to stick it now. It's going to throw balls. I'm not going to be able to stick it again. So, um, but leaving the balloon and use it as a target for a stick, it will will get you into the track almost down the, the SVC, which you want the tip of the catheter in. Yeah, I, I've had some success using uh, uh, balloon angioplasty, using IVL. Uh, then I typically follow that up with a uh, non-compliant balloon to minimize the recoil. Uh, so that's actually a very good talk. Um, I, uh, in 2006, gave a, a Sandra Venus uh, uh, talk, uh, just like you did, um, with uh, use of non-compliant balloon so without stenting. And in our early experience here in Beckley, we were able to prove that the use of non-compliant balloons can uh, sometimes prevent use of stenting. I only stent when I when I think there's significant recoil of the um, of the subclavian vein um, or even the SVC. But uh, yeah, so I'll say a little look into this technique. I'll talk to you about it some more. Thank That's you. True. Yeah, thank you. Any further questions from the audience? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shadi. Appreciate it. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you. Man. I appreciate that so much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Our next speaker would be uh, Dr. Uh, Uche Ugoji. He's coming to us from Salem Hospital, Wari. Uh, he's uh, the director, medical director at the hospital. Uh, Dr. Ugoji is a uh, an ardent uh, believer in lifestyle modification, and he has always graced our um, our uh, uh, seminars and con uh, conferences uh, with uh, uh, talks. And we are uh, thankful that he's going to give us a talk in that in that in that uh, space. Dr. Goji um, is active with um, patient care in Nigeria, and also uh, has been a great supporter of uh, the um, in, of our initiative in West Africa. Uh, when we travel down. Dr. Goji, thank you for the talk and look forward to hearing you. Dr. Goji, are you here? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oye. Thank you, Dr. Oye, for the introduction. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. We can, we can hear you. Oh, yep. fantastic. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to... Uh, before anything, I thank Dr. Oye for this invitation to be part of this uh, virtual conference. Um, I, 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 I can say that over and over again. I thank you for your mentorship and also for your support in what I'm doing here. Yes, um, it's been a long day, so I shouldn't take so much of our time. Good evening, everyone. I'm pleased to be presenting um i can have my slide up now i'm pleased to be presenting i will put your slides up the first. effects of lifestyle modification on yeah the effect on biomarkers in common atherosclerotic vascular diseases we've been talking about uh, lots of um atherosclerotic diseases you have peripheral arterial disease. So what I'm not going to be talking about anything technical here. What um, I'm presenting is just about our life. And that's very fundamental. 
you know. So if we we'll project the slide properly, can you project for me? Uh, we can see your slides. Can you see them? Okay. Yes, I can. Okay. So sure. I'll be speaking along those um, subheadings. I'm going to make some introduction about the, 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 the subject matter. We'll talk briefly about atherosclerosis, um, lifestyle modification and chronic diseases, and then the endovascular markers of interest, effect of exercise on the markers, effect of diet on the markers, and then um, a proposition, a suggestion on how lifestyle modification can be introduced you know, into a busy clinical practice of whatever type, and that also includes include um, into vascular clinics. And then I will conclude. Can we have the next slide? The next slide, please. Thank you. Um, common vascular diseases include peripheral arterial diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and of course, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms. Coronary artery disease, ischemic heart disease, renal artery stenosis, and cerebrovascular diseases, and many others. But those are common ones that we deal with. Vascular diseases, they account for a significant chunk of morbidity, mortality, and disability worldwide. And for example, stroke as one of those um, cardiovascular diseases. Um, Cerebral vascular disease rather accounts for approximately 5.5 million deaths annually, with a whooping 44 million disability adjusted life years lost. And unfortunately, Africa is bearing um, a significant chunk of that as low and middle income countries. Um, atherosclerosis is a leading cause of the majority of vascular diseases worldwide and ischemic heart disease which is one of um, atherosclerotic um, cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of premature death dealt globally. Next slide please. So the peripheral arterial disease which is quite very um, common even in this part of the world uh, um, by peripheral arterial disease we're talking about diseases of the artery in the, in the lower extremities, like the lower legs, the renal, mesenteric, and abdominal aortic territories. It's a relatively rare cause of mortality. People don't die commonly from it, but it's a major cause of morbidity, you know, and commonly manifesting as intermittent claudication, clinical limb, ischemia, reduced mobility, and unfortunately, in some you know, cases, amputation, which is quite common in this part of our world. The next slide, please. Now, for common lifestyles, I'm sure we are familiar with them, but in, in lifestyle medicine, we talk about six pillars, used to be five pillars, now six pillars. You have um, whole food, plant-based diet, stress management, avoidance of risky substances, substances like substance, uh, um, 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 uh, uh, abuse substances and alcohol are the risky substances essentially like you have marijuana, cocaine and all that and then cigarette smoking, restorative sleep, social connection and physical exercise. Those are in six main pillars. So we are talking about as we talk about lifestyles, those are the areas what our focus in this is just healthy eating pattern and physical regular physical exercise. Those are the two um, lifestyles, as health promoting lifestyles, I would like us to just focus our minds on healthy eating pattern and regular physical exercise. And disease promoting lifestyles, just to mention them, to keep us, you know, um, uh, keep us on our toes, as far as disease promoting lifestyles are, cigarettes, smoking, it leads it, as far as uh, atherosclerosis development is concerned, sedentary living, uh, unhealthy eating pattern, and excess alcohol consumption. I want us to take particular note of what I'm going to, I'll read it the way it is. Diet-related risk, tobacco and alcohol use, and physical inactivity are responsible for more than 40% of disability-adjusted life years lost in high-income 
countries like the US and Europe, Western countries in particular. And approximately 90% of cardiovascular risk is attributable to potentially modifiable risk factors. Lifestyle related factors account for more than half of these. This is the audacity behind lifestyle modification. Next slide. Lifestyle modification and chronic diseases, still talking about the ma many major uh, modifiable risk factors for atherosclerosis have been identified. And there is, um, they all seem to be, mo in most patients, you have many of such risk factors, you know, coming together like an aggregation of risk factors in one individual. That is also well established as a fact. And some of those risk factors, uh, modifiable risk factors include smoking, cigarette smoking, obesity, you know, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, and diabetes. You know, there are changes that are quite widespread in health behaviors and use of treatment for these risk factors are responsible for some of these dramatic changes or improvements we've seen in um, vascular mortality in high income countries. And there's also been, and this is also being replicated in developing countries, although very slowly, because uh, um, smoking sensation can prevent most of the excess mortality from disease promoting lifestyles. And smoking actually contributes a lot. That's what I'm saying. Just quitting at the age of 50, half the risk of death, and quitting by the age 30, by age 30, avoided most, almost all of those risks. Pathology samples of lung tissue that have been um, studied after 12 months and beyond of uh, smoking sensation have shown tremendous change in the structure as the real look of the lung, what they call the smoker's lung. After 12 months of complete sensation, it's been known to revert to normal, especially in situations where it's, um, they've not, the, the lungs have not started losing yeah, last thing, the uh, last thing in there. Next slide. Um, lifetime modification entails long term, long term um, change in long term habits, typically of eating and physical activity, and maintaining them over many months and years. Like it's a natural way. Lifetime modification is a natural way of achieving therapeutic goals in many disease conditions. And so it needs to be integrated in the management of chronic diseases of all types, of all levels. But it, I, I say it is treating chronic diseases at their very roots. Arterial stiffness predicts an increased risk of cardiovascular events, and that has been shown in many studies. There is strong evidence that inflammation plays an important role in a development of arterial stiffness, and it is now known to be reversible. I want to take note of that. We'll talk about that a bit you know, later. I, 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 I brought this, the old Colandra criteria for defining chronic disease, quite well, very old, many years ago, it's been dropped, included amongst other criteria, irreversibility of the pathology process. That is no longer true because they are now known, chronic diseases are now known to be reversible, especially when you intervene with lifestyle modification early in the process of their development. Thanks to lifestyle medicine for that. Next slide. The next slide, please. Okay, thank you. A chronic disease of arterial wall, that is arterial sclerosis. It's a chronic disease of the arterial wall that is initiated by lipid, in particular LDL, that's low density lipoprotein deposition oxidation and modification. Those are changes that take place when a um, LDL gets into the intima, the intima of the endothelium. And that provokes inflammation that ultimately leads to thrombosis. That's nice plaque formation that will lead to narrowing and then uh, thrombosis and stenosis with consequent ischemia and infarction. This process of atherosclerosis is now known from both randomized and uh, meta-analysis, I, I mean, evidence, uh, high-level evidence is now known to be to begin early in life, from as early as teenage years, 15 years of age, and continues throughout life. 
The new concept of arterial sclerosis is a continuum of histologic changes in arterial wall with early stage, with I mean progressing through its early stage, intermediate stage, and late stage, and the advanced stage is not worthy. Because the early stage of arterial sclerosis is reversible. At the early stage, you have the lipid accumulation, the cellular infiltration, and foam cells, deposition of collagen, post glycans, and elastic fiber. All those come to that. At that stage, before the actual consolidation of the plaques and, and, and commences, it is known to be reversible. Next slide, please. Of course, when it progresses, it's, it's, uh, it, it crosses into the, the media and intima layers. The disease of atherosclerosis have a latency of, latency of many years. That means when it starts, it can remain subclinical for many years, as many as 40 years, and becoming clinical in middle ages. That is what is now known. And of course, as uh, you guys are well familiar with as endovascular surgeons, it affects more than one vascular bed. Atherosclerosis and its complications, there are many there are major, um, major adverse cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events. Yeah, we are quite familiar with those. And cigarette smoking makes endothelial cells release inflammatory, inflammatory um, cell, I mean inflammatory um, cytokines and substances, and also pro -thrombo thrombogenic cells and substances, causing damage to the endothelium and sclerosis ultimately. Persistent hyperglycemia is known to induce endothelial damage, as you see as we commonly see in diabetic patients, through the reduction in the nitric oxide that protects the endothelium. Next slide. Now, just to talk about uh, markers, a marker, a biomarker is a, is a characteristic feature in, 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 in vivo that can be measured quantitatively and objectively as an indicator of both normal biological process, pathologic processes, or pharmacologic response to therapeutic intervention. And we have uh, both uh, risk biomarkers, we have preclinical and clinical biomarkers, and of course we have markers that we use that are used to monitor the progression or regression of diseases. Next slide, please. Now, these are some of the, um, li the li list of biomarkers of interest that uh, lifestyle modifications are known to impact. We have markers of inflammation, and that stands out. C-reactive protein, both the highly specific C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and, and as those are two key inflammatory markers that can easily be measured. Low-density lipoprotein, High density lipoprotein and triglycerides are also markers, biomarkers that um, um, monitor the disease process called atherosclerosis. Then the pulse wave velocity can also be measured. That um, that is a measure of the, the endo, uh, um, endothelial stiffen, coronary intima media thickness, coronary artery calcification, flow mediated dilatation endothelial independent dilatation, then a highly sensitive cardiolipin um, I, which is a, a, an early, a subclinical marker for cardiac damage. It's very important to know that. And then HbA1c and high blood pressure, they are also characteristic um, biomarkers that also uh, I, uh, monitor or can be used to study and do I mean, atherosclerosis. Next slide, please. Now, the effects of exercise on biomarkers. The many lifestyle interventions, such as aerobic exercise training, weight loss, dietary or antioxidant supplementation, have truly been demonstrated to improve vascular health in adolescents with and without cardiovascular and metabolic risk factors. 
and they have been successful also in adults to improve vascular structure and functions. Improvements have been seen in a pulse wave velocity uh, through and it's been demonstrated by it is dose dependent. The more the exercise, the intensity of the exercise, the more the improvement in, in that in that biomarker from aerobic exercise. Lasting a study that uh, study two studies in particular, you know, that lasted 16 minutes for three times daily for eight weeks. And then six and one, the other one lasting six months respectively, you know, found those improvements in um, the pulse wave velocity. Mayor et al. found out in addition, found out in addition that there are improvements in the um, um, cardi and coronary intima media thickness. Continue. Next slide. Exercise, there are an exercise also known to decrease LDL and increase HDL. This is very well known. And we know the, the value of increasing LDL, having high HDL, that is HDL more than 40. It helps to remove, it helps to remove LDL from the intima layer and um, helps to some extent regress the process of arteriosclerosis, especially in its early stage. But then prevent or slow down progression in its mid, in its intermediate and late stages that are not reversible. Aerobic exercise has also positive effect on reducing inflammatory markers such as um, C-reactive protein, tumor necrotic factor, alpha and interleukin six. Next slide. For dash diet, most of us must have heard about dash diet. DASH diet on biomarker. DASH diet is a dietary approach to stop hypertension diet that is well studied, once declared to be the best diet for the, for, for the Americans. It's a diet that is known to reduce the highly specific um, cardiac, I mean, sorry, I mean, cardiolipin, cardio, cardiolipin, um, cardiac troponin and troponin I, rather within four weeks of feeding with greater diets. That means greater plant-based diet, if in place a plant-based diet that is given over 12 weeks was found to reduce that um, biomarker. And when it was extended beyond, no, for four weeks, the value of the reduction was more for 12 weeks than four weeks in that study. And it's also shown that DASH diet has both early and cumulative effects from that study. That is both on subclinical cardiac injury. DASH diet, Mediterranean diet, and most recently, the plant-based diet have all been shown to consistently reduce LDL. These diets highlight fruits, vegetables, nuts, whole grain, legumes, plant oils, fish oils, no added salt, pork, poultry products to get from um, chicken or turkey, and then fish, and then low or no beef. That is the summary of those diets that uh, are recommended. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Plant-based diets and Mediterranean-based Mediterranean diets are known to improve LDL, HDL, and highly specific C-reactive protein. DASH diets also known to improve blood pressure by as much as four to eight millimeter per mercury. In patients with type two diabetes, HB1AC reduction was greater in patients with plant-based diets compared to those with conventional diets. And improvements as high as uh, between 0 0.56 to 1.3 uh, improve uh, increase, percentage increase has been shown from both randomized control trial and meta-analysis study. Next slide. Now, how do we integrate my, my suggestions on uh, in integrating lifestyle modification in a busy clinical practice? Because really, we as doctors, both generalists, specialists, we are aware of the benefits of exercise and um, LD eating pattern. We are aware, but there's this lethargy. Application is, is suboptimal. Like I said, yeah, it must begin with me. 
we must lead as practitioners, right? whether we are general practitioners, we are specialist practitioners of whatever special specialty, we must lead by example. And, and by example, I mean, we need to also start with ourselves in doing the right thing, eating rightly, doing exercises regularly, because not smoking and all of that, because it's only when we live, when we, we do it, we can pass it on to others. So it, it, it really must start with us. And then we need to also find a way to integrate lifestyle history into the body of history taking, whatever the specialty is. And it's very quick. I do it very quickly. Just ask about fruits and vegetables. Like I'll ask, are you, are you, are you high, middle, middle, are you high or low or mid, mid, middling in fruits and vegetables? Just that is enough. And then you ask about exercise. Do you ever do any form of exercise? You can go further, the type, duration, intensity, and all that. And you promote healthy eating and exercise in just few ways. Yeah, just few ways. And that's in just two, three minutes, you can. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, just few minutes, just saying a few things about healthy eating and exercise. I call it, you sow a seed. You know, it is known that when you sow a seed in that matter, just mentioning, just mention, asking the patient and raising it to the patient and bringing to the patient's attention, that is, is able to move a patient from the pre-contemplative stage of uh, um, change to contemplation and sometimes even action and plan and preparation, you know. And then you say, you give the patient printed markers and printed uh, patient information leaflets because in a very busy practice, sometimes you just get some of these um, uh, um, prints, print out and give to the patient a smoking sensation, exercise, diet. Just go and read it and you tell the patient, uh, we'll talk about it the next time we see. It's known to help patients. Okay, next slide. So by way of conclusion, the natural history of atherosclerosis as a continuum, beginning from early years at which stage it is reversible and that even in the later stages, its progression can be halted through lifestyle modification as highlighted the audacity of lifestyle modification in the comprehensive management of atherosclerotic vascular disorder. The key lifestyle interventions are, of course, exercise, healthy eating, especially plant-based diet and cigarette smoking sensation. The integration of lifestyle medicine in endovascular practice is feasible and highly recommended. Thank you. And those are some of my references in the following slide. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. George. Do you have any questions, contributions? You're all welcome. Thank you. Dr. George, quick question for you. Uh, yeah. What's the relationship, relationship between the blood type and the foods you should eat? There is no relationship. I've heard some people say. If you're yes, blood, there is no, there is no. All I've checked, it's not, it's just a, just one of those things that circulate in on WhatsApp and uh, I call them home um, uh, neighborhood doctors. <laughs> it's not, I've had, I've, I've read a book, but not written by a doctor. <laughs> it's a very extensive book, but yeah, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense. I, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything new, but in my recent check, no, no, no connection was out your blood group type and, um, you kind of food you eat. Very and, manifest, and the manifestation of disease. No. no. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Budgie. Nice job. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, Dr. Larson. Hi. Hello, hi. Welcome. Thank you. Are you ready for me to get going? Absolutely. Let me go ahead and introduce you now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I see you're on the, you're, you're busy. Always. <laughs> well, Dr. <coughs> cardiac surgeon who uh, uh, is now currently based in Memphis, Tennessee, correct? Yes. She was uh, previously based at the University of Iowa. She uh, does a lot of complicated cardiac work, and uh, we're 
grateful for her coming on again this year. Last year, she gave us a great talk also. And this year, she's going to talk to us again as a consultant in cardiac surgery on a very important topic, lightening the load, debulking with angiovac for operative optimization in infective endocarditis. So uh, Dr. Larson, we welcome to the uh, sixth annual Endovascular Conference for Africa in rural America. And we really uh, thank you for doing this for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, my friend, for inviting me. It's great to see you all. May I share my screen? Yes, you may. Thank all you. All right, thank you. All right. I'm gonna share this one. All right, how are we looking there? Uh, it's good. perfect. Great. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much. And is the volume appropriate as well? Yes. All right. Thank you. Well, I am delighted to be reinvited um, to this wonderful conference. And as a cardiac surgeon who usually does a lot uh, through a sternotomy, it was exciting to have a, a technique that we are increasingly utilizing in my practice, which is endovascular in nature. Um, and it is to utilize an endovascular device to help debulk infective endocarditis in the right side of the heart. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, our objectives today, we're going to recognize some of those indications for vegetation debulking and right-sided infective endocarditis and describe the technique for vacuum-assisted vegetation debulking in right-sided infective endocarditis and to summarize the advantages of this technique. So it starts with a dilemma. And usually this will happen on a Friday afternoon as you're thinking you're going to be able to wrap up and get your weekend started. Um, you get a call from an outside hospital that they have a patient who's been sick for weeks, um, typically with an upper respiratory issue. Um, perhaps they've even advanced to needing mechanical ventilatory support. Um, they've got terrible consolidations in their lungs and their workup um, after it's been determined that they've got a bacteremia, they get an echocardiogram, which is showing a vegetation a growth, um, typically on the tricuspid valve, <coughs> excuse me, um, ca likely causing some tricuspid valve regurgitation, um, but then throwing septic emboli to the lungs, causing a severe respiratory compromise. And as the causative etiology being this infective endocarditis, they're calling you the cardiac surgeon to take this extremely sick patient and therefore very poor uh, surgical candidate for an emergency surgery to remove the mass um, that is breaking off and uh, causing this extreme level of pathology in the lungs. Um, this also um, in the setting of perhaps unknown um, source of the infection or poor source control. Um, one does not choose to put a, uh, a very expensive valve prosthesis in the setting where risk of reinfection is very high. So what do we do? Well, we have an endovascular solution for this. And in cases where an intracardiac mass, specifically a right-sided cardiac vegetation um, is threatening the life due to the systemic illness it's causing, um, additionally adding difficulty in, in overall patient management, they can have high mortality rates. This vacuum-assisted suction embolectomy device um, is designed to remove those vegetations in the right atrium. It's intended for use as a venous drainage cannula and cardiopulmonary bypass circuit for the removal of the vegetation during extracorporeal bypass um, up to six hours. But the procedure itself especially after um, less than a handful of cases has never taken up to six hours. Um, 
So utilizing the pump that you can keep on the shelf, a filter and reinfusion cannula, this cannula facilitates venous drainage as part of an extracorporeal bypass procedure. Again, up to six hours as indicated. Um, the funnel tip design on this cannula is angled to help in positioning so that you are directing this immediately across from this vegetation, but not necessarily abutting it. So this works by flow. It's not meant to um, uh, remove chronically adhered vegetation or calcified masses, but rather the very friable, um, fluffy, if you will, vegetation, almost by sheer flow alone, this cannula sucks up that, that infected mass so that it does not break off and travel to the lungs, um, causing the severe pulmonary compromise. Um, the funnel has a radio-opaque nitinol funnel tip um, that allows for better visualization under fluoroscopic imaging. And in addition to your fluoroscopic imaging, you will also utilize transesophageal echocardiogram um, for placement and confirmation of that. The funnel tip also enhances the venous drainage flow um, and prevents any clogging of the cannula with uh, the fresh, soft thrombi or emboli. So this, the cannula with that has the vacuum attached to it is most commonly placed in the superior vena cava. Um, the venous return, um, uh, sorry, the return cannula coming from the pump is typically positioned within the IVC just below the cavoatrial junction. And then the, the suction uh, vacuum assisted um, cannula is positioned within the right heart, again, immediately um, across from the infected mass. The procedure in kit and products include the cannula, the bypass circuit, um, the bubble trap, um, a micropuncture kit to gain your venous access, a dry seal sheath, an arterial reinfusion cannula. While it's not positioned in an artery, it's arterial given um, the direction of the uh, blood flow through it um, compared to the pump. The extra stiff wire, um, which is an exchange length, a dilator set, and then the centrifugal pump and the pump head. So I would advocate um, that these procedures are done in the operating room, especially for the initial cases, certainly in more of a hybrid or even um, a cath lab situation, this could be done. Um, our cath labs have much better imaging potential than the C arm that we typically are forced to use in the operating room. Um, it is done under general anesthesia. Um, so the patient is intubated once they arrive to the OR if they have not been already. Um, a TEE probe is used to assess overall cardiac integrity. Uh, take a really good look at the tricuspid valve and right atrium and to visual, visualize the vegetation um, both before and after the procedure. So before, so you know they can assist in directing the positioning of the cannula um, and also to visualize the vegetation and certainly after um, so that you can um, declare victory um, once the, the mass is no longer seen. Uh, fluoroscopy is also used during the procedure for adequate placement of your guide wires um, and placement of the cannula as well. And then a modified Seldinger technique is used to assess the right internal jugular vein as well as the right common femoral vein where your cannulas will be placed. Um, the venous drainage cannula is in, inserted into the right internal jugular vein and venous reinfusion cannula is inserted into the right common femoral vein. So you're meeting this mass from above and below. 
Uh, both cannulas are then connected to a VV ECMO circuit. Um, the angiovac system is de-aired and then connected to that circuit. The patient is required to be heparinized to an ACT um, of greater than 250 seconds. This is especially important um, as, as a consideration if you have a patient who has unfortunate neurologic uh, septic emboli, um, which is more commonly seen in cases where there is a left-sided um, infective endocarditis. And I do need to say that the FDA has approved the device only for the right side. Um, anecdotally, it has been utilized for left-sided endocarditis. Um, and also, one must not have a patent foramen ovale um, for this reason, so that you do not get embolization of this mass um, to the left side and to the brain. But if you did have evidence of septic emboli to the brain prior, um, careful uh, partner um, carefully with your neurology team to understand the risk of any potential hemorrhagic conversion um, when you're exposing them to a larger bolus of heparin. Typically, um, a 5,000 unit bonus or 100 unit per kg um, bolus is necessary to achieve an adequate ACT. Some patients are refractory to this. So if there's any neurological issues um, or evidence of embolic disease, careful consideration needs to be placed before heparinization. <coughs> Please excuse me. The suction device is introduced into the venous drainage cannula um, in the neck and then placed in close proximity to the tricuspid valve. That's where this gentle J or bend at the tip of that funnel cannula um, is important because of course the tricuspid valve is not positioned immediately um, in, the, in the middle of that right atrium in a plane that um, is uh, easily accessed um, directly. And so that curve, that gentle J of the funnel tip helps to direct this towards the tricuspid valve. Um, and then always use both fluoroscopy and TEE for location verification. Um, suction is started, the vegetation um, then gets trapped inside the filter of the angiovac system. And you continue to uh, initiate flow you get your flow up as high as it will go, um, usually to about 2,500 RPMs on the circuit. Um, suction, the suction then helps to draw this mass um, into the filter. And the flow continues until you're able to appreciate resolution on both TEE <coughs> and seeing the presence of this mass um, that you vacuumed. Um, in the filter. So with some of the techniques and maneuvers, again, you wanna position the cannula near the vegetation, but because of the suction, you don't want to directly abut or um, approximate this cannula on top of, um, in continuity with the mass, because that suction will just suction down on the tissue without being able to um, a vulse in a way, the fresh emboli. Um, you, when you deploy the funnel, um, it's through a bit of a sheath. So as you unsheath more of your cannula, you get a greater curvature um, in the tip of that funnel. So if I'm not unsheathed, your funnel tip is in line with the rest of your cannula. As I unsheath that funnel tip, it makes a greater angle um, um, back towards you. So utilize that to your advantage. Um, uh, you will initiate and optimize the flow on your circuit, advance the cannula towards that thrombus. And some might advocate for a little bit of a gentle sweeping motion. So just rotating from like a, a 12 o'clock to a three o'clock position um, only about a 90 degree change on the cannula externally um, to create that sweeping motion for um, comprehensive removal of the mass. Um, 
Then once that's complete, uh, flushing the filter and then repeat your imaging to see resolution. So in the top series, the arrow on the far left is pointing to the mass. Um, and then again, we see the presence of the mass. And then in the third uh, view, we see the normal leaflet of the tricuspid valve without the bulky infected mass um, continuing uh, persisting. And we can see then um, on in that filter in the far right uh, bottom right hand corner, um, the dark uh, thrombus uh, appearance of the um, infected mass that was removed. And then as far as outcomes are concerned, right? So we're doing this not so much as a palliative procedure, but it's because we have a very sick patient who would not otherwise tolerate a, by, a cardiopulmonary bypass run, who, whose lungs are so dysfunctional at this point, they would have a prolonged ventilation time post-procedurally. So by doing this procedure, we can debulk reduce our embolic burden and systemic burden of disease, allow the lungs to recover and heal, allow for a longer duration of antibiotics to complete, to complete uh, source control, and then bring these patients back who are far better optimized to undergo an open heart procedure on cardiopulmonary bypass, without an extended ICU time and extended hospitalization, extended vent time, et cetera. So how successful are we in accomplishing this? And is it worth um, the effort? Well, we would say yes, um, that the majority of patients, um, over 75% um, have blood loss less than 250 cc. So there's not the usual transfusion burden that one often encounters in a very sick patient undergoing an open heart procedure on cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, the extracorporeal bypass time is typically less than one hour for the majority of procedures. And we see this visualized that the most, um, the most common time frame is 30 to 60 minutes um, to, to gain success in debulking this mass. Uh, the major comp the most common complication um, is bleeding, but that's occurring in only 3.8% of patients. So the advantages is that we're able to get bacterial clearance. We're able to decrease our length of stay, um, not only in the um, initial period, but also in the post-operative period when we're bringing back a better optimized surgical candidate. We're decreasing healthcare expenditures, um, which I will explain in a moment, how do you do two procedures um, and still reduce your healthcare expenditures. And then we've got a high survival rate and most importantly, I think, is improved pulmonary function. So some of those advantages have not just been theorized, but actually proven. So we look at this group um, who uh, approached tricuspid endocarditis um, that was clinically deemed to require intervention. So they randomized these patients into an angiovac cohort versus surgery. Um, where they were taken um, directly for a tricuspid valve replacement. Um, with the angiovac group, they showed they were able to resolve the bacteremia prior to an interval tricuspid valve replacement. They're able to withdraw any vasoactive medications less than 72 hours after the intervention. The periprocedural hospital length of stay as well as the ICU length of stay was shorter. And the cost was $6,800 lower. So this is, if we look for a primary um, first time infected endocarditis on the tricuspid valve. When they looked at those patients in this group who had recurrent endocarditis, the cost savings was over $40,000. Um, so typical presentation, a young patient, uh, maybe with some hepatis, hepatic dysfunction um, and IV drug abuse, presents with a mass on their tricuspid valve, associated severe tricuspid valve regurgitation. The angiovac 
yielded a 60% reduction in the size of vegetation. That is still a success. Sometimes in these chronic infective endocarditis, it can heal and, and be more calcified or less amenable to um, the suction. Um, however, you are still uncovering a layer of this mass creating a surface where antibiotics are going to be more readily taken up by that infected mass because you're able to vacuum off that um, biofilm off of the infected mass. Um, the antibiotics, uh, antibiotic specific blood cultures remain negative after the angiovac. Um, the patient was able then to undergo drug rehabilitation for one month on IV antibiotics without recurrence of symptoms, um, able to complete drug rehabilitation as well as antibiotics as an outpatient, and then followed up clinically every three months with a drug screen and echo. Why is the drug screen and echo important? Well, number one, um, if we are going to invest in a valve replacement for this young patient, we want to have some assurance that it's not going to be immediately reinfected um, with continued IV drug abuse. Um, so to treat them with angiovac, have them follow up at three month intervals for one full year, and also showing no um, congestive heart symptoms due to their uh, tricuspid valve regurgitation. Um, if there is any um, resulted after the angiovac is important. Um, it has not yet been published, but the series of 150 patients that we have treated in this manner with angiovac and then, in, and then moving on to an interval um, tricuspid valve replacement when they have successfully completed a year of, of uh, drug rehabilitation uh, with no positive screens, We've only been able to accomplish that with four out of 150 patients. Um, so the, the drug addiction is serious, um, but we have not been left um, heartbroken, uh, no pun intended, over a patient we've invested a lot of resources into who has reinfected their prosthetic valve. So at one year, when they're clean and able to undergo a tricuspid valve replacement, they get it done and they're in much better uh, shape to undergo that procedure. So in conclusion, um, our angiovac can remove bulky endocarditis to reduce systemic disease burden and optimize patients for eventual valve surgery. The technique we use uses extracorporeal bypass. The cannula aspirates the vegetation, delivers to, it to the filter and blood is returned to the heart. Um, the advantage is that we get ultimately better surgical candidates, have shorter length of mechanical ventilation and length of hospital and ICU stay. It affords us decreased recidivism of prosthetic valve recipients, and it allows us also a tissue specimen for a specific and effective uh, antibiotic therapy. Um, these are some of the references of the studies that I mentioned. And um, again, I thank you so much for the invitation and getting to I uh, share this time with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Larson. Once again, thank you so much. Uh, do you have a suggestion as to whether this needs to be done in specialized centers like yours or, or any cardiac surgeon who has experience using ang angiovac should, use, should, use, should do this? That's a great question and um, one um, that we've had to strategize. Um, as this is new, um, it is done in specialized centers just because there aren't, a, the, the, there aren't centers with the technology um, widespread. <clears throat> it has been useful to me because it, it, it allows an increased referral basis. And I think you want a team that's experienced in managing this and doing this procedure, um, doing it. So um, we have a higher volume because we're able to capture our friends and colleagues in, in multiple surrounding states and within our own state, and they come here. Now, um, some of these patients with infective endocarditis do not have the best social history. Um, they're not a population of patients you want to fill your hospital with. 
So it is important when you are accepting these patients to um, generously suggest a transfer agreement so that once the patient has transferred to your center to undergo the angiovac procedure, once they have been stabilized in that periprocedural period, they will be going back to the hospital that sent them to continue their IV antibiotic therapy, get, get weaned and get prepared and get the resources needed to go back home. Sounds good. Yeah. Very good. Any other questions from the audience? Okay. Very well. Thank you, Dr. Last. I guess we'll see you in Orlando next year. Yes. Thank yeah. you so much. Look forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Likewise. Bye-bye. Kate on the uh, on the other program for next year, the education program. Before then, okay, thank Sounds you. Good, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, we'll have a case study by Dr. Oye next. Um, we're just pulling it up. Yeah, since this is a uh, a practical experience. Uh, we're going to this uh, conference is not only to be uh, um, but lecture based, but we want some practical tips of the trick. So um, we had in our, in our service at this time, Allison um, was uh, able to uh, put a few of the things we did recently. So we'll talk about them and uh, see how uh, doctors around the world might also um, see them. All right. So I'll just briefly go through a few and um, share some of the uh, information. Again, the, the fundamental premise of endovascular surgery cannot be discarded. They are, you must have a wire across the lesion. As you'd seen from Dr. Shadi's presentation, a wire has to go through even an occluded vein for him to intervene. So that is a fundamental of endovascular surgery. Uh, we, uh, Dr. Shadi did, did present, present the central venous occlusive disease. And here's a case of a patient uh, with malfunction AV fistula that had a proximal stenosis. Uh, so we'll uh, go ahead and show the first picture. Well, what well, we took the patient to the operating room and did a venogram. Uh, again, the venogram was done and it did show a proximal stenosis of the cephalic vein at its origin to the um, axillary vein junction. And you could see that's about 80% stenosis approximately. And you could see the um, irregular shadows of the contrast in the vein. You could see the normal sized um, subclavian vein. And uh, we'll take a look at the next picture, please. And uh, you can see the got, got the glide wire in this case, 0 0.035 glide wire, and it's preferentially going towards the basilic vein. So we had to redirect it um, towards the subclavian vein on the next view. And uh, once we did that, we uh, selected um, a stent. And here lies the problem. If you're doing this in Africa or some other remote parts of the world, where well, you don't have a appropriate stents or balloons, then the patient uh, may be subjected to a bigger operation. So it's important that at some point, you don't have to have all the complements of stents and wires, but you must have some basic ones to work with. And in this case, we did select a non, uh, we selected a, a covered stent uh, to uh, treat that area because of increased stability it would give us. And also, because once you balloon that fragile vein, you have standard risk that with excessive ballooning, you could rupture the vein. If you rupture the vein, then you're scrambling to put, if you look for a covered stent. So why not put a covered stent ahead of time so you can balloon to your heart's desire. And even if you rupture, this covered stent is already there to protect you. So that's the rationale behind that. So you could see the uh, covered stent being in place and the balloon, uh, ballooning of, of the covered stent. And next, please. And you see the balloon fully inflated and uh, improvement in the area of stenosis. And uh, this was a eight millimeter <laughs> by 50 centimeter uh, stent we've used here, covered stent. Next. 
And again, looks much better. Next. And the final picture. So that's the beauty of endovascular intervention. No cuts involved. Wire in the um, AV fistula. Made the wire go through the stenosis, um, uh, put a microvenous sheath, do a venogram, identify the problem first. Because when the patient came to me at, at, in the clinic, uh, she had AV fistula that was not performing well. That was diagnosed in the dialysis center. So I knew immediately that she must have a proximal stenosis. So the first step is to identify the area of the stenosis. The area of stenosis could have been where we found the stenosis, or it could have been in the subclavian vein or the axillary vein. It just happened to be at the origin of the cephalic vein. So uh, uh, next picture. Awesome. Okay, so this last picture, you can see the stand in place and the final picture of the AV fish, the thrill was stronger and the patient did well. Uh, just a closed incision with a zero, with a 5.0 uh, proline suture, uh, held pressure of about three or four minutes. Patient was discharged home within 30 minutes. Next. The, the, the next patient is a young 40-year-old female who uh, traveled uh, from West Virginia to New York. And when she returned, uh, noticed some swelling in her left thigh and leg. Uh, she uh, waited about almost 30 days prior to uh, returning, uh, prior to getting a vascular uh, consultation. At that time, she had been placed on uh, eloquist therapy, and she was taking that twice a day. Patient uh, had marked edema of the left lower extremity and uh, DVT confirmed by ultrasound of uh, the FAMPOP segment. And uh, venogram was performed because of strong suspicion for complete occlusion of the left iliac vein that was consistent with LeMay Turner syndrome. And uh, we proceeded to do the venogram as the first picture of the shell. You could see area of complete uh, occlusive disease of the left iliac vein. Uh, we were able to cross that with uh, glide wire and then uh, did some thrombectomy device to uh, remove the block clot. Once we removed some block clot, we identified the area of strict stenosis of the vein and we were able then to do some angioplasty techniques. Next one. The, the uh, you could see the uh, final product here. Uh, we did stent the area after we did thrombectomy of the vein. We did stent the area. Uh, the, the common iliac vein was stented, and we ex extended the stent to the external iliac vein, and we had great flow. Next. Then, uh, because of the instability of the uh, left iliac vein stent and due to the nature of the stenosis, we had to put, uh, buttress it with a kissing stent on the right side. Uh, so it was the case of May Turner syndrome that we were able to successfully treat with uh, stents and uh, patient resolved quite nicely. She was seen uh, as an outpatient uh, the, following, the following week, uh, marked improvement of, in the uh, left lower extremity edema and the symptoms she had, which included pain, as well as the numbness that had resolved on follow-up a week later. She continues to be on blood thinners and she would be for a few more uh, months. She was referred to hematology for the workup to ensure she does not have any major issues uh, with uh, clot, clot and disorder, uh, such as uh, lighting factor five or anticardiolipin protein or the likes. Next, that's it. Okay, so that those are two good illustrations of a venous case uh, uh, with uh, DVT and another venous case with uh, uh, cephalic vein uh, stenosis or occlusion, a near occlusion treated with angioplasty and stenting, demonstrating the value of endovascular, uh, endovascular intervention and uh, the need to uh, treat patients uh, uh, using this uh, technology. One of the things I also want to mention 
is uh, with respect to DVT, last year we had a great talk uh, uh, from Dr. Palmashaw, the current president, uh, incoming president of the ICDS on um, DVT and uh, PE. Uh, we purposely did not put that much in the purview in the in the in the uh, schedule this year because we wanted her her give us a talk again next year, uh, hopefully uh, on the same topic because of increasing rate of uh, DVT and PE worldwide. Again, Africa is at a disadvantage. Where if you have PE, uh, if you're in bad shape, you could probably uh, join your ancestors. Uh, but uh, uh, in the U.S., we have ways to uh, sometimes help this patient a lot more rapidly. So, um, uh, so again, uh, we'll talk more about DVT and PE on next year's uh, program and also during the crown rounds during the year. Okay. Okay, so is it available? Is it available? Good. All right. No. Okay, so um, we'll move this down to the la uh, to the last uh, speaker for the day, who has graciously stayed up all night in Australia to uh, help us out. Um, we thank you so much, Dr. Bayat, uh, for Thanks joining so us today. Uh, Dr. Imam Bayat is an endovascular vascular surgeon um, in um, Australia. He comes to us today, uh, uh, thankfully, to uh, give us a talk. Um, of interest to him, and uh, we look forward to hearing him. Dr. Wyatt, uh, uh, I hope uh, you're doing well in Australia, and hopefully the is good. Fantastic. It is. Thanks very much, Dr. Oye and Iman, please. Um, and uh, thanks very much, and apologies for the delay. Unlike uh, you in the U.S., uh, we we take it easy here in Australia. And five o'clock in the morning, it's it's a little bit earlier for us, but but, uh, but no, this is good. It's a nice warm morning uh, here in Melbourne. It's spring, and uh, and we get warm days and cold days, and th this is a warm morning. So it's it's lovely to be among you. And thanks very much for the opportunity to to present here. Um, I won't take too much of your time. I'll just bring up my. Uh, slides if I can. I think I just have to go desktop. I think it's this one here. Okay, dogs. Can you uh, see the slides? Yes. Yes. There. All right. Let's uh, let's get into it. Um, so global vascular companionship. Um, this is an initiative that was born uh, really after I, I became a counselor on the World Federation of Vascular Societies. And I'll share with you in a minute how it, the journey started for me personally uh, a few years ago. Um, but our mission is clear um, for each person in every nation to access equitable vascular care. As a starting point, we believe that every country with a population of greater than 100,000 and every tertiary hospital with a catchment of more than 5 million must have at least one vascular and endovascular surgeon. Now, like many of you here, uh, I'm a vascular and endovascular surgeon with a public, with a busy public and private practice. You know, um, uh, I admire them greatly, but I'm not one of full-time humanitarians who are out there constantly in the field. I wish I could one day, but no, that's not possible for me. So th this is a, a program for day-to-day -day vascular surgeons, endovascular surgeons around the world who can, who I believe can make a difference. And, and the mission is sometimes inconceivable. And, and I have to be honest with you, sometimes I think to myself, who are we kidding? You know, equitable vascular care for everyone. But we have to start somewhere, and and we believe this is this is a, a good initiative. Um, in the dearth of evidence around um, vascular surgery provision around the world, it was really refreshing to see uh, this paper from Dr. Gaffey's group um, that we all know non-communicable diseases are on the rise in low and middle income country, and they looked particularly at aortic aneurysm, ischemic stroke, and peripheral arterial disease, and found that in upper middle income countries, that has surpassed high income countries, and the rate of rise in low income countries and low middle income countries is uh, staggering. 
Um, in the U.S., uh, Dr. Oye, uh, you have 101 vascular surgeons per 10 million. Um, that number drops to about 10 to 13 in Morocco. And in Ethiopia, this paper uh, suggests that it's 0.28 vascular surgeons per 10 million. In my own group, Dr. Margaret Chi, our registrar, is trying to map out areas around the world where there is no vascular or endovascular surgery. And her initial work is represented in this map here, uh, which shows uh, countries in red where there's no evidence of vascular and endovascular surgery, at least online. The next phase of her project is to approach these countries directly. And of course, the natural thinking is that, well, general surgery and all other surgical specialties are all lagging behind in these countries. But the more data that we get in, it appears that vascular surgery in particular is lagging behind in these countries. And this is an application form that we've had from an excellent general surgeon in Ethiopia. And you can see in this hospital that has a catchment of 16 million, every single specialty is there bar vascular surgery. And they have all the necessary infrastructure on paper, CT, MRI, ultrasound, um, and, and of course, a very large catchment area. The antipode, which if you draw a line straight through Ethiopia and come out on the other side of the globe, will come out to the Pacific and nearby is the country of Fiji. And there we have a similar picture, 500 bed hospital, uh, a tertiary hospital, excellent surgical instrument. This is their cath lab. And I'll come back to this cath lab a bit later in this presentation. Um, and yet again, in uh, a couple of years ago, uh, no vascular and endovascular surgeon in that country. And we can talk about all night, all day, um, why vascular surgery is lagging behind in low middle income countries. Um, I suggest that we have this conversation in a, in a slightly better setting with a, with a beverage and, and go on uh, um, looking at various reasons, but, but it could be because it's a newer and less known specialties, um, the transition between communicable, non-communicable disease, the dabblers, I guess, in vascular surgery, you know, that general surgeon that occasionally would put a stitch in an artery and would say, well, that's it. I've got vascular surgery covered, infrastructure challenges, um, and maybe not seen as a lucrative field for, for surgeons trained in low income countries. However, the truth is that we do have these tertiary hospitals uh, with necessary infrastructure. So let's create a formula. If we have this and we have a young general surgeon who aspires to become a vascular surgeon, then what next? What next for this person? And to, for that, I'd like to start with where my journey started with this, the story of Barbados, a country of 300,000 people. In 2017 and 18, the government offers a scholarship for a surgeon to travel overseas, trained to become the first vascular and endovascular surgeon for Barbados. And then began the series of phone calls. And many of us are familiar with this. Many of us who, any, anyone in the journey of surgery would remember the challenges of getting training, but it's particularly hard for people outside, I guess, of a, of a country system to do this. Phone call from surgeon to surgeon, island to island, people around the world until eventually word got to a, a former mentor of mine in Perth, and he called me one night and I'd just taken up the role of head of unit at my hospital. And, and he said, there's this opportunity, would you take it? I wasn't sure what I was necessarily getting myself into, but I said, yes. And it was one of the best decisions that I certainly ever made. Um, Dr. Nina Yap came to us. She was the backbone of our unit during COVID. Uh, she trained with us for two years and uh, she returned back to Barbados in February of 2022 to set up the first vascular service there. Since going back, there's been a slow buildup of vascular surge, uh, vascular cases. Um, she still remains accredited at our hospital. Uh, so she attends the MDT meetings every week. Um, her private hospital there is getting a C arm. She's doing some endovascular work and open. She's on the board of Global Vascular Companionship. And in fact, it was she who came up with that line for each person in every country to access equitable vascular care. 
Um, next, that the journey of Fiji. I had the opportunity to travel there in 2019. There, um, since then, our companionship began with a social media-based uh, WhatsApp link, and we had almost weekly case discussions. Admittedly, now most of the cases are are general surgical case discussions that are done with our radiologists who are in the group. But um, anyway, that link continued. Uh, Dr. Sela Koe Mabel came to join us in uh, August of 2022, and he's trained with us for a year. And in fact, Sela went back this year to take his daughter back to see the motherland. Her daughter was born uh, in Australia. And on that holiday in, in, in Fiji, um, sorry, he went back to Fiji. On that holiday in Fiji, um, he took some equipment and performed a peripheral angiogram, angioplasty in that very cath lab that, that was previously only used by cardiologists. We expect Dr. Koy Mabel to complete his training in August of 2024 and return to Fiji uh, and, of course, the ongoing companionship there. Um, so that's where the idea comes from. Global vascular companionship, its concept is about connecting units, established vascular units, established vascular surgeons who are mentors with developing vascular units and, and aspiring young general surgeons who are mentees. And it provides an important ingredient to this, and that is um, credibility. Um, once the, the matches are approved, we forward this to the World Federation of Vascular Societies and get letters of support that would enable people to travel to each other's centers. Um, I'm going to Ethiopia in January, and um, and you know I couldn't just pick up my bag without any connection, without any introduction, without papers of support, and rock up at at hospitals. Um, and and this uh, we believe helps individuals perform this um, connection. Um, at its core, it's a match program. Mentors can apply by this QR code here on the left and mentees can apply by the QR code on the right. The application form also requires a CV to be attached or discussed at the Global Vascular Companionship Board that has the support of the Australia New Zealand Society of Vascular Surgery. And then that is then forwarded to the World Federation of Vascular uh, Societies um, uh, for those letters of support. And then we check in on the applicants and make sure that they're doing okay. Uh, and if the connection is not working, we try and find other solutions for them. Um, at the Global Vascular Companionship Board, it's uh, this is a rough scheme of what, what things look like. People move through a match setup. We have discussions about mentors, about mentees. Sometimes we have to reject applications because they come from a place where there's already a well-established vascular training pathway. This is primarily for countries that don't have vascular surgeons and vascular societies. Um, and then they move up and matches are created. We ask for letters of support from uh, the mentees and also society letters from the mentors, like this one that was produced by the Australian New Zealand Society of Vascular Surgery. Once at the World Federation of Vascular Societies, then letters of support are created for them and signed by Palma Shaw, current uh, Secretary General of the World Federation. It's a growing team of companionship. We have a constitution that has been created. Um, uh, we wrote a constitution for it. Uh, there are volunteer executives. No one is paid in this program uh, at the moment. Uh, and we are very soon going to register this as a not-for-profit organization. Um, the papers are, uh, the application is almost complete and the lawyers have uh, the necessary things to apply. And once approved, then we will be going for extra funding. Um, we will be looking for recruitment of paid executives and also continuing to recruit volunteer executives at this time. So really, come join us. It's a group of uh, vascular surgeons and, and other um, in interested uh, stakeholders. And we're looking for mentors, we're looking for mentees. Um, if you have deep pockets and want to be a benefactor, please come join us. 
um, volunteer executives. There might be, you may not be a mentor mentee, but you may want to put some time to, to take this project forward. Or uh, you may want to offer your time and, and conduct online lectures once a year. That could also be great help. So come join us, uh, please, if you have the time. These are the QR codes again, if you're interested as a mentor and a mentee, it's really the first point of contact with us. It's, um, it just tells us a little bit more about you and, uh, and also uh, allows us to put you um, on that uh, flow chart. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you, man. Uh, very well. Thanks. Nice talk. I appreciate your, uh, your work. Um, Along those lines, given the fact that vascular surgeons are really a, a rare breed worldwide, um, how can we go beyond? Uh, we can't wait for one vascular surgeon to be to be trained. While in the meantime, what happens in the meantime? How can we train a host of uh, general surgeons, uh, other specialties? to have some vascular skill set, so in very remote areas, so they can perform perform basic things. That way, you know, patients don't lose their lives. And again, using maybe a virtual means to, um, in addition to in, in person, which is what we currently do, in person yeah. uh, things to kind of uh, bridge that divide. Yes. Uh, I think you, you press on a very important point, you know, in this day and age of AI with um, technology, uh, with great audiovisual, is is there always the need of somebody to travel and have a fellowship? That's certainly one model of of companionship. Um, this program essentially connects people, but um, like the example in Ethiopia, we we also travel to those centers, perform um, um, uh, surgery together with the surgeons. Our online platform with with Fiji, um, there was a case where uh, there was a. A uh, prisoner who'd severed their brachial artery, and and the general surgeon there had never performed the bypass, and uh, but they were excellent general surgeons, and they said, well, it looks like it's I can see the two ends, they are not coming together, and and we talked them through a a a um, a bypass using a great saf reverse great safness vein, and uh, that worked. It stayed patent for for um, several months, and the, the arm healed. So um, uh, I think that, you know, I think there are many ways of, of doing this um, and uh, the match is something that we've been focusing on over the last nine months, just to get that part of the um, uh, framework right. But we're always looking uh, for people like yourself with these ideas and, and, and to come and help us, help us uh, reach more people. Would you have yourself any thoughts about this? and how we should do that? Uh, yes, the current model I use, uh, again, it's important. Uh, you, It's important at least be present in those communities first yes. and to actually assess the issues on ground. Then yes. after on that, you have to identify a group of uh, supporting um, uh, colleagues uh, that would be interested in building a program. Then yes. once that program is built, then you have to use the virtual arm to augment the persons on the ground. So if they have a case like you did in Fiji, uh, where you cannot really really jump on a plane to go, then you have those persons that can be able to uh, do some of those things with uh, virtual uh, assistance from, from you or somebody in your position. So I think currently what I've done, I, the, the, the uh, program in Nigeria, that one of what was very difficult for me to see is it's a lot of limb loss in Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, so you go to the northern part of the country. If you're unfortunate to be in one part of the country and there's no C-arm or the vascular surgeon there to take care of your problem and it's an acute problem, you may end up having to travel to, to a different part of the country. And if you, it depends on per person's uh uh, income level too. They may not be able to afford by flight. They may have to travel. And I had an unfortunate case where a patient I had an ischemic leg, uh, wanted to travel, could not travel by air because the politicians closed the airport. Okay, yeah. so he had to travel by land, but not a sixteen hours before he came in. By the time he got to me, because I was still in the country, 
the leg was too far gone, even though I tried all things possible to save his leg, it was not feasible. So again, one of the things that I've done um, uh, or try to do now is to have collaborations with different hospitals in the north, south, east, west. So the basic yeah. things must be that must be present with CR, at minimum a CR. So yes. that as a vascular and a vascular surgeon, but that is CR, you can't do much. So you know you yes. can do surgery, if you know, but if you want to do something minimally invasive, you need a CR at minimum. So if they have a CR in those centers, and now we start to identify the physicians that are interested in, in the vascular work, then we can certainly do the training. Uh, with conferences such as this, in-person training, and build up, and again, many fellowships, many residencies, or whatever it takes for them to get the skill set necessary for them to perform adequately, safely, of course. And uh, then, for example, if I go to Nigeria right now, I'm in the northern part of the country, uh, collaboration with one hospital now, because of the events of the last experience I had, the hospital there now acquired a CM from the United States that's just been delivered. So if I go oh, there, for example, I can treat somebody in the vascular there. If we have a hospital in the south part of the country that has a, a, a CM cath lab has been functioning since 2017. So if I go there, it's like I'm in the United States because equipment works. If I'm in the western part of the country, there are big hospitals there and they have CRMs and, and um, cath labs, so I can do work there. So that's the benefit I see for that patient who has an ischemic leg or something that requires endovascular intervention, we would need to have persons take care of them closer to the area where they live. Again, the idea of getting a um, uh, center of excellence in that regard in the north, south, east, and west in a country of danger with 200 million people makes sense. Again, also reducing the, uh, again, when people come to the hospital, it's cost prohibitive for some of these people. Per capita income is $360 a year. So, mm -hmm. The idea of doing office-based outpatient labs in those settings in low-income, middle-income countries makes absolute sense because they come in, the vascular trained person or less trained person that's working with a trained person can virtually, in some cases, give the orders to treat the person. They leave within 15, 20, 30 minutes an hour, don't have to stay in the hospital and can be managed as outpatient completely, decreases the cost. Uh, I've tried that option in the U.S. Uh, and uh, the outpatient lab concept works very well. And I'm about to start that process again in Nigeria as a test test case, see how that works. Even though we have a hospital in the South that works, the outpatient model, I believe, will be very, very, very much cost savings to the patient and with less cost prohibitive for the patient. And therefore, patients, more patients can be treated that, by that method. So those are the things we're looking at. And we do have affiliations with uh, cardiac surgeons, uh, some general surgeons, some family uh, uh, trained consultants. And that's that's the framework we're building right now. That's that's fantastic. Thanks very much. And that's great um, things for me to think about. And and um, and, and of course, uh, Dr. Oye, we, I've been, I've been trying to cajole him into uh, coming into Global Vascular Companionship since <laughs> since uh, November of uh, last oh, year, and and that that would that is that that groveling will continue going forward. That's that will never stop. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, that's that's a great idea. How do you start? How do you? Because that is one of the things that I found was there is that initial steep learning curve. Um, uh, that, you know, many general surgeons have never seen a sheath, um, you know, access, downhill access, and geography. There is a steep learning curve, but there must be that cur curve. And we've had, we've seen this with um, one of our mentees who sort of tried to start this on their own in, in their, um, in their country and, and, and things, the results were not great because, um, and then there's nobody to back you up or bail you out. And so the complications can go up. So how do you start this with with, with the general surgeon? Do you go out there and train them? Do you bring them across? Um, prior to COVID, um, we had a few, I trained a few cardiac surgeons, even in the United States, uh, who came in to my uh, center and we trained them uh, because we're already cardiac surgeons so we're able to you know learn the skill set and go. I had a yeah. uh, cardiac surgeon came in and in six weeks did 250 cases. 
enough okay. skill case for him to go in and do endovascular surgery. I had another yeah. um, cardiac surgeon come from Nigeria, I spent about a month and also had some skill sets and was able to, to go. Then COVID yeah. came around and put a, a stop to that um, agenda. Uh, so what we're doing on the back end now is taking it to them. So I go and um, identify where the needs are. I call mm -hmm. myself a freelance global endovascular surgeon. So wherever the needs are, I go. And when I go, I try to make sure I capture persons of interest to kind of get them interested. And then we build something from that from that point. When they need help, I go physically. And if it's something that the more skilled surgeons can take care of, they do it. Fantastic. Great we'll point. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll talk more about it. I'll certainly uh, I'll reach out to you and uh, we'll uh, try to pull on this global initiative. And I still remember your your mentee uh, from uh, the builders uh, in New York. Yeah, so yes. very well. So yes. look forward to seeing you and her. And maybe I'll yes. make a trip and go go visit her in Barbados and uh, see what happens there. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Look forward to seeing you next year at the conference. Thank you so much. Okay. Cheers. All right. So very well. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us uh, from all parts of the world, Australia included, and um, down under. And uh, we're grateful that you've uh, spent some time with us during this process to learn about endovascular surgery. We'd I'd like to thank Relagena Hospital CEO, Mr. David Bunch, and this administrative team for the opportunity for us to uh, be here uh, for them hosting our conference this year. I'd like also to uh, give special thanks to all the speakers um, who have uh, graced us with their talks today. And I hope the talks have been of benefit to you and you might be able to apply them in your clinical practices. Uh, though we, we thank them for the generosity of their time and I hope to see them again on, on the next uh, or on the seventh uh, um, uh, end of ASCO conference next year. We also would like to take this opportunity to thank all our other affiliates around the world. Um, the um, hospitals in particular would be uh, the following Bielsa Specialist Hospital in Yanagua, Bielsa, Nigeria, uh, Silver Cross Hospital in Abuja. Uh, we have uh, Sil uh, the uh, Silver Life Mission Hospital in Port Harcourt. We also have um, uh, the Uricare and Dr. Sanusi, uh, my special uh, cardiac surgeon in um, Lagos. And um, we would also uh, like to thank the Uzuma Foundation, which is doing great work in trying to uh, help with healthcare uh, disparity that we see in um, underprivileged communities in Africa and other parts of the world. And more also, would also like to thank the ISEVS as well as the Edward B. Vassal Social Society for um, being able to um, uh, participate with uh, this uh, con uh, conference this year. So without further ado, I'd like to say thank you so much for staying, and we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. We have a host of other speakers tomorrow, and don't forget to fill your CME-related uh, issues. If you have concerns, you can send them to Dr. Gupta, and uh, we'll, uh, I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I put my thank email... You, yep. Uh, I put my you. email in the okay. chat, so if anyone... Uh, could, if everyone can email me their name so I can get the CME surveys to you by next week. Thank no you and all tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Okay, there. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.